When my partner and I were through hiking in Canada, we were on one of the longer more remote sections. We were about halfway through the section hiking through a curvy tree covered tunnel like area where you can only see 30 feet ahead of you at times. All of a sudden 15 feet ahead of me is this old skinny tall man standing on the side of trail. This man had no backpack or anything remotely equipped to be this far into the backcountry. At first I wasn't thinking anything of it and stopped to say hello. As my partner walked up from behind the man barely even looked at her and started acting a little creepy. I take a quick glance down at his coffee mug in his hand thinking I'd jokingly ask him what the hell has doing out here with only a coffee mug, then I see that his hand is dripping in blood. I didn't say anything about it but quickly said well we better keep hiking, have a good day. As we were hiking away I told my partner about his bleeding hand. We hiked for the next 4 hours constantly looking back over our shoulders. Later I checked the map and realized that there was a road that was about 1 kilometer away that ran parallel to the trail, so it could have been possible that this man just was out for a little morning hike to look at the ocean views, but still freaked the f out of us at that time, and I still wonder why his hand was all bloody. Me and three of my friends went biking on a trail that was closed for the night during high school. The trail is in a large park that closes at sunset and this is about 1 to 2 am and maybe 40 degrees outside. We decided to head to this hidden lake we knew about, but it turns out they had paved up to it recently. Awesome. The lake is kind of small, maybe a little more than a football field across at the most. Everything was pretty dead quiet except for some frogs and the trees whistling. The night was pretty clear and you could see a lot of the stars. As we cross this new bridge over the edge of the lake that goes over a stream, I start to hear laughing. I thought I was hearing things or maybe one of us had somehow gone around while I wasn't looking. I look at my friends and they're all there and they hear it too. They looked as confused as I did. I asked them what the hell was going on and they had no idea either. At first, it sounded like it came across from the lake. But it wasn't like someone really laughing at a joke, it sounded like someone laughing at us because they could see us but we couldn't see them if that makes sense. Suddenly, it sounded like it was coming from different places around the lake. Then it got super loud. It sounded like the lake and forest exploded with noise including the sounds of the frogs. It suddenly sounded like thousands of them were croaking so we freaked out and booked it on our bikes. At one point, we were going uphill the way we came and it felt like someone lifted my tire and flipped my bike backwards. I hopped back on and started looking around but couldn't see anyone. It's pretty dark and the moon is barely showing. It still felt like I was being chased and I kicked it into third gear up that hill and pedaled as hard as I could. It was like I could sense something behind me the whole time but I couldn't figure it out. The laughter kind of stopped after about a half mile, but I didn't stop until we reached the end about, five, miles later. I ended up catching up to my friends near the end who were freaking out because they hadn't noticed I was gone until about five minutes before I pulled up to them. My legs were so destroyed the next day, I could barely walk. I've been back to that lake since, but never at night and it's pretty popular now. There's all kinds of weird stuff that supposedly happens in the forest all around my city, but they're typically just stories people make up when they're drinking. A popular one is a type of animal slash humanoid that glides through the trees without making a sound and listens for people who are deep in the forest. A lot of people do go missing and some of them are never solved. But I think it's mostly the rednecks who get in disputes over meth. Was on a backpacking trip at with Lacucci Forest in Brooksville, Florida. When we got to the site, we found enormous cat prints just outside of camp while collecting firewood. Fast forward to the middle of the night, 
I'm sound asleep in my hammock when something pushes down on one of the straps, causing my head to elevate and waking me up. I freeze and wait to see what'll happen next. Slowly it releases and I'm laying flat again. No footsteps or anything could be heard. The next morning I ask if anyone had accidentally wandered into my strap in the middle of the night. No one had. I can only assume a Florida panner had curiously inspected my hammock, then walked off. I've been a national park ranger for close to two decades. Protocols have changed a lot in that time. I write this just to try to keep people safe for the next time you venture to the big outdoors. Let me tell you about the last park I worked. I can't be too specific about the location for my job's sake. Anyway, we had clusters of campsites that we rotated annually. The idea was to prevent one group from getting overused and worn down, let nature regrow a little bit. The winter had just passed, and our big summer season was a few months away. I'm sent out to check the suitability of the campsites to decide which ones need time to recover, and which ones we can open up. Winters here are cold. Not too many people camp during the winter aside from rugged masochists and Boy Scout troops lead by people who believe they are rugged masochists. I didn't expect to find much out of the ordinary. The first site was clear and ready to go. As I'm trekking to the next site, I see what looks like some debris and junk down a ways in a river valley. Looks like some jackasses set up an unauthorized camp down there. Usually when that happens, they leave garbage and smoldering fires. This is going to be a pain to clear up. I approach, seeing the telltale wreckage of what must have been one hell of a party. Stuff scattered everywhere, the skeletons of tents still raised up. And blood. I stop, and time stops with me. Pools of blood are spread out along the ground, next to signs of something heavy being dragged into the brush. I pull my radio off my belt and pause. I then pull my Glock 22 out of my holster and rack one round. I'm a certified law enforcement officer, but I haven't had to use my gun in a long time. I quickly look around for any movement, then get on my radio and call in for backup. While I wait, I listen. Silence. Silence in nature isn't good. Pray get quiet when they sense a predator. I hope all the birds are being still on my account. I edge forward slowly, looking for anyone or anything. A shredded plastic cooler. A tent that has been annihilated, with more blood splashed on the walls and inside. People died here. I know it. You can't lose that much blood and just walk off. But no people. Shreds of clothes, and a little viscera drawing all the goddamn flies here, but no people. I've seen bears rummage through camps and destroy anything that looked edible. There are wild hogs here that cut trails through the deep brush and are even more dangerous than the bears. But this isn't either of them. The devastation here, it's just too much. Some scourge of God came through here and just ripped everything to pieces. Finally backup arrives, and I'm sent to report to HQ. They even brought medics out here. I don't know why, there's no one here to save. One of the new recruits vomits at the scene. I'm glad to get the hell out of here. I get back and HQ is a buzz. Only four people work here, but calls are ringing, Printers printing and the air feels electrified. The manager sees me and signals me to his office. He's pale, ashen looking with bloodshot eyes. I sit down by his desk, and he goes to the door and locks it. I've never seen him lock that door. He asks me what I saw. I tell him, uninterrupted. He looks even paler afterward, and his hands tremble a bit. There's a very long pause, and I expect more questions. He doesn't ask any. I leave, then hear the door lock behind me. After a few minutes I hear him call someone up, 
and a long low conversation ensues. I never see him again. Word comes down from on high. We're assigned a new manager, one who excels at what he calls crises. His first order of business, a controlled burn of the unauthorized camp and the sites closest to it. I'm not arguing, I watch the smoke rise in the distance and pray that's the end of it. New orders, relocate the existing campsites closer to HQ. Before we do that, we stake out a few trail cameras at the new locations just to make sure it's not in the middle of a nesting ground. We put up a few cameras pointed at the hog trails through the brush for good measure. A couple days pass, and we go out to collect the footage. The new manager takes it all and starts studying it in his office. A couple hours into reviewing, he freaks out. Starts screaming and yelling. Gets on the phone calling up the line spitting more obscenities. He spends the rest of the day and that night in the office, calling up specialists and planners. Next morning I show up for a meeting. Manager doesn't look like he slept. Massive changes afoot. He lays out our new plans, including massively bright lampposts circling the park border as well as floodlights around the ranger station. Campsites need to be moved even closer in. Clear lines of sight from the light, if possible. I butt in, telling him that defeats the point of going camping. If you're just going on a short walk through the grass then setting up so close you can see the parking lot. He tells me to shut up, that it's just the start. The park now closes at sundown, sharp. Also, we're now required to have a long gun on our person at all times. Now it isn't uncommon for rangers to carry an AR-15 or a Remington 870 shotgun going out in the deep woods. There are wild and rabid animals out there. The real concern are massive pot growers. These aren't your chill neighbor who hides a few plants behind the tomatoes. They run the spectrum from large-scale suppliers who like their privacy and dislike law enforcement to anti-government crazies who think we have no right over them, the true patriots. Both groups have a few common points, they tend to be well-armed, they do not like lawmen, and they won't shy away from taking a pot shot at some dumb poor ranger who finds himself in their fields. Keep in mind Elliot Ness. Mr. I fought Al Capone and one got scared off busting up Appalachian moonshiners because they constantly sniped at him in the foothills. They shoot to kill. Those are the reasons we keep the big guns around. Not routine patrols. I drew the short straw and got the overnight shift. Manager tells me more changes to protocol will be listed when I return. Overnights used to be easy. Monitor the radios. Bust up the parties if needed, check for poachers if they're operating nearby, make sure the forest doesn't burn down. I clock in and per instructions, go to the gun cage. My, things have changed. Our shotguns have new rifled barrels, so they can handle the solid slugs we've been issued. That's the kind of firepower you want to take down a charging bear, God forbid you ever need it. The R-15s have been stepped up too. The old 15-round magazines have been replaced by 30-round ones. Someone even snuck us in hollow point rounds. Makes no damn sense. Shooting in the woods you need full metal jacket ammo so the rounds don't go wild when they touch a twig. Hollow points just exist to do more tissue damage. This is ridiculous. This is overkill. We're not a war zone. We don't need this firepower. Next to the radio, there are new instructions. Now we're not allowed to directly respond to emergency calls. We can reply, figure out what the issue is then we report to a new phone number I don't recognize. Time passes slowly tonight, I'm not even allowed to leave the building until sunup. A few uneventful nights pass. The new floodlights and lampposts are frying my eyes. It's so bright out there a blind man could see. A week later some kids roll into the lot. They grab their backpacks and start hiking up the ridge. I know what they're up to, 
No one has booked a campsite that night. Cheap young ones going on a camp out that will be a raging party. I wait for the sun to go down, confirming they're not out for a day hike. I call my manager to report. He instructs me to call the new number. I report up to them now. A curt voice answers the phone. He asks my park, then pauses. He asks the issue. Bunch of kids on an unauthorized site. Do I go break it up? I can see their campfire out the ridge right now. No. Do not leave the building. Do not attempt communication. That is all. Report if there are any developments. Right after daybreak the manager rides up. It's real early. Have you seen them? Did they leave? No. The car's still there. Let them rest. They're probably all hung over. He curses. Non-stop. He then goes inside to make a call. I'm outside looking up the ridge when he exits the station. One AR-15 in his hand. Another one strapped across his back. Glock on his hip. He marches single-mindedly toward his car. I try to ask him what in God's name he's doing but he isn't listening or responding. He takes a jerry can of gasoline from his car and marches up the ridge. I yell after him, to no reply. I consider following him, but that doesn't seem like a good idea. I go back inside and call the number. The same curt voice. The same direct questions. Yeah, the manager went up to that campsite. Armed to the teeth, and carrying gasoline. What the F do I do? Stay there. Do not interfere. Backup is inbound. Report if there are any developments. About the same time I start to see smoke wafting off the ridge, two vans ride into the lot at a screaming speed. A dozen men, heavily armed and armored exit quickly. I go out to check, who are you guys? What's going on? The men are all lined up with that impeccable military precision. One of them, a commander, I assume exists the vehicle last. He says, which direction did he go? I mean he's up there. I point at the increasing smoke. The men fan out and start jogging up the ridge. I hear rifles cocking as they leave. I try to shout after them, but no response. I look at the vans they came in. Large, nondescript. They just say DOI response team on the side. Half an hour later they return, dragging the manager with them. He is bound in zip ties. He screams, I did what needed to be done. Trust me. It's worse than they thought. We can't stop this. Burn it all. They throw him in the back and sedate him. The commander approaches me, my neck hairs bristle in cold fear. I need to see the office. All computers and anything with a hard drive is coming with me. He mentioned videotapes. I need those too. I unlock the doors and they ransack the place. Everything gets taken. Printed reports from the last few years disappear into those vans. The videotapes get bagged up and held by the commander himself. He studies the gun cage. Cute. You're out of your league. He scoffs. Finally they found everything they looked for. The commander tells me, call the number. Tell them it's contained. You need a new superior. Also, don't talk about this to anyone. They leave, and just on cue the fire brigade and a few news vans show up. The fire is contained, the news reports say. Rumors of missing campers are unsubstantiated at this time. Still the rumors alone are enough to scare of this season's campers. The quick change-up of managers is chalked up to bureaucracy. The press dies down after a week or two. The new manager is very good at dealing with them. Thankfully with no new campers and our now even shorter open hours, we can get more work done around here. Rebuilding the station took some time, and we just set up the new campsites. 
They're practically spitting distance from the station. Nothing dramatic happens for a few days. Then on a whim, the manager tells us to set up some cameras around the station and the campsites. There's usually so much human activity around here all you see are some raccoons. Maybe the rare hungry bear but we humor him and set them up all around. Couple of days pass, we collect the footage. I play poker with one of the rookies while the manager watches hours of footage of an empty but brilliantly illuminated parking lot. Then he gets to the footage around the station. Screams come from the office. We barge in and he's stamping on the camera hard drives, gibbering things I can't understand. Along the lines of, told me it was clean, safe. No recent activity. BS here I'm not gonna do it. He barks at us to leave. Later he makes a call. Rookie goes up to the door and listens in. Rookie comes back reporting, yeah, he's demanding a transfer. Says they lied to him. Something about they didn't do their jobs properly. He's not prepared or equipped here. Then I just heard the phone click, and some sobbing. Hours later, my manager exits the office. His shoulders are slumped, defeated. We cut our hours even further, practically open on weekends only. We'll have a full staff ready those days, but a skeleton crew the rest of the time. Campers are required to check into one of the closest sites. No campsite and they're told to leave. We are not authorized to leave the station after dark under any circumstances. In an emergency, do not call 911, call the number and do exactly what they say. We draw straws for who gets overnight shifts. Why we need to stay overnight if we can't do anything is beyond me. I asked the manager about it and he just said that standard protocol is to have someone on hand to report any irregularities overnight. I have to work my overnight shift. I keep my phone close, the number dialed in, ready if I need to call. It is a bad night. I just wind up pacing around with my shotgun, glancing into the bright floodlights, trying to see what's past them. I hear crickets, and it relaxes me. Prey is quiet when predators are around. It is a long night. The next night, my manager draws the short straw. He seems resigned. In the end, we all have to take a turn. He brings the brightest damn tactical flashlight I've ever seen. Said he bought it just because he's afraid of the dark. He isn't really. He's afraid of the things in the dark. I get a phone call at 3 a.m. It's him. Get over here now. And bring guns. Wah? You have a damn arsenal. Now. Oh I swear to god I messed up. Oh man, I think they're attracted to the light. I called that number and all they said was backup would be here in the morning. Oh god damn. I hear the piercing staccato of gunshots. A pause. More gunshots. Screaming. Scuffling. The line goes dead. I call the number. A new terse voice answers. Look I work at X Park. I just got off the phone with X. I just spoke with X. What can you report? Something bad happened. It's serious. I heard gunshots. We will have backup there as soon as possible. Did he say anything else? Yeah. He said he thought they were attracted to the light. Doesn't make sense to me. Interesting. Thank you for your report. The park is now closed. You will be reassigned. Goodbye. Click. Officially, the park was closed to be scheduled for a controlled burn. Let the old trees die and make room for new ones. There was nothing in the official report about what happened to the manager on duty. The public understanding was bureaucracies need to be shaken up on occasion. No one asked any more questions. I get transferred to a new park, halfway across the country. Change of scenery and beautiful. They've got some odd rules here too. Don't go far after dark, 
and don't carry a flashlight. I'm concerned about why. Why can't you use a flashlight at night when you need one? They won't tell me. Be safe everyone. I was 14 at the time me and my family went on a 10 day hike in the snow. We were late to getting to the first but and had to walk about an hour in the dark. It was creepy, through the forest. The toilets at the hut were about a 200 meters walk from the huts. One night, not sure of the time but early morning. I went to go to the toilet at one of the huts. There was one long wooden path to the hut entrance but towards the end it go bushy and there were about four different paths going down the end, to like camping platforms others walks and the toilet. This intersection scared me because the trees towards the end must have rubbed together and made a really loud freaking sound. While Jay was walking to the toilet I shone my light over to one of the other paths and two white things gleamed back. I literally crapped my myself and ran to the toilets. Not a good idea. As it faced a wide meadow, I shone my light out of the toilet door, the toilets were raised, and as I was doing it I saw another two white dots I again shat myself but as I went to go back into the toilets I dropped my headlamp down the stairs. They went under the structure, where the big tanks full of crap and piss were, I had no way to get them back. It was either I waited till the sun rose or I risked scaring me, injuring myself or getting lost. I sat in the toilet for a good hour, I was also scared of drop toilets so that wasn't good either, I couldn't stay up all night because we had a 10 hour day ahead of us and I didn't trust myself enough to walk back to the hut, I waited a fair hour. Then another hiker was coming to the toilet so I bolted to them and told them what happened they didn't really care but at least I had light. The next day when we were just about ready to go, I looked down the path turns out the white dots were just the reflectives in the helicopter pads. I was so tired that day. Out back of my own 30 acre property there is a big grove of eucalyptus trees. I was walking out there to get to the river because me and my friends were going to drink some beer and generally chill by the river but when we walked by the trees, that I've walked by 1000 times before with no weirdness, I thought I saw a little kid peeking out from one of the bigger trees. So I told my friends look right there is that a kid or what? A about 4 foot tall humanoid thing peeked out that was pale white like a grayish color. It had a weird head and honestly that's about as descriptive as I could be because as soon as I saw it my hair stood up and I just ran as fast as I could back to the house to grab my gun. We still go past those trees to get the river sometimes but we never do without a gun. I wish I had not been so scared because I feel like I should have filmed it. The park ranger. John Gann's home away from home is the woods. Specifically, it's the woods of Mission Tejas State Park, 21 miles northeast of Crockett, Texas. He works as a park ranger, taking church groups and school trips through the forest, showing them the woods he so dearly loves. He also shows them relics from the local Caddo Indians that used to live there as well as pioneers who settled a couple of miles away, at the Rice House. Back home, he has a wife, who is retired, and his best friends. He loves his wife and friends, but the park was like that friend that you never really talked to, but you got to know him and enjoy his company. He was at peace with the local wildlife, which he had known all his life. On breaks, he drove a couple of feet off the trail, found a stump, and sat down. He was at peace in the forest. He loved his job, and made damn sure that everyone else will, too. His fantastic stories of Caddo hunts and local legends were loved by all. He made sure that everyone at least knew about what happened. One day, he was taking a group of school kids out on a walk. He talked about the deer, and the birds, 
and the pines that seemed to stretch up for miles. He was leading the group up a steep hill, when suddenly, he became dizzy, and short of breath. He thought of this as merely the result of his aging body. Then, he began feeling pressure in his chest. A small alarm was ringing in his head, but then he blames the bean-eating competition he had the night before with his wife and friends at the local Mexican restaurant. It was only when his left arm began to feel as though a thousand volts of electricity had pumped into it did he begin to have concern. He knew exactly what was happening. A heart attack. Before he could cry for help, though, he collapsed. He came to moments later, dazed and confused. He got up, and caught movement out of the corner of his eye. The curious ex-Vietnam vet stumbled then walked up the hill, as if nothing was wrong. At the top of the hill were a group of people dressed like the local Caddo Indians. They seemed to have been led by a young woman, holding a baby. They seemed to be dressed right, but something just didn't feel right. Who are you? John asked. Nothing. Can anyone answer me? No response. Well, look. It's been a nice conversation we've had here, but I need to get back. Thank you, said the woman. What? John stammered out, dumbfounded. You are the man who has told our story when no one else would. For that, we thank you. From behind the woman, a small army had amassed. Indians, settlers, ranchers, soldiers, anyone who had lived and died on the park's land. Finally regaining his composure, John replied well, y'all are more than welcome. Now if you excuse me, I need to do my job. The Caddo woman gave John a sad smile, saying I'm afraid you can't do that anymore, John. You're going to be here now. Confused, John turned around. At the bottom of the hill was chaos. His crumpled body lay still in the cool, moist clay. Meanwhile, some parents were performing CPR on John's vacant body, while others tried to get help, and others were trying to comfort the kids. Some of the kids were crying, while others were sitting, trying to wrap their young minds over what had just happened. Some of the bigger, more curious ones were trying to poke John's body with sticks and fingers, trying to stare if he would move and somehow, some way, jump back to life. Everyone had their own ideas on what to do, but panic, then desperation, then realization set in, one after the other. John was dead, and nothing could be done. John watched all of this from the top of the hill, his spirit's presence unbeknownst to the others. Rangers swarmed onto the scene, but a blanket over his body, put his body into the back of a jeep, and drove off. Suddenly, Mexican food didn't taste as good as he had remembered it before. Edit. For those of you who may have read this before, I was told to edit it for formatting, and resubmit it. A bit of backstory. I live in Houston, but my family has lived in Houston County, TX, especially around Crockett, TX, for generations. The story comes from a book called Ghosts of Houston County. Eerie Tales of East Texas. Everything in this story is 100% true, right down to the park's ghosts. The Rice family is one of these ghosts, who appear as the settlers. They built a cabin to serve as a waypoint for travelers and merchants. A replica of the cabin is in the park. I am a direct descendant of the Rice family, as well as one of the county's founding members. So this story is actually pretty personal to me. Was on a big road trip across America going to a bunch of national parks. Friend of mine was working at a YMCA right outside the Rocky Mountain National Park so I stopped and visited. On this road trip I would just hammock where I could, or just sleep in my car. My friend told me about a great spot to hammock. It's up on a hill overlooking a lake, out of the way of most people, and has a great view of the sunrise. 
But to get there you have to hike up this road that almost no car could drive up. By the time I get to where I'm meant to start hiking it is already dark. I have my car parked on the side of the road, driver's door closes, but the driver's side back door open. I'm getting my pack ready for this fairly short hike with my headlamp on. Suddenly every bug in the vicinity goes silent. When that is the only background noise, it is very noticeable. So I look up and look around a bit before hearing a stick break in the woods about 20 feet away. Like something stepped on it. I immediately dove into the back seat of my car, shut the door, and locked my car. My only thought was this could be a bear, or a mountain lion. Either way, F this. So I crawled through to the front and drove away. The next day my friend told me some of her co-workers went up there that next day and saw bears on the way up. A couple months ago in late fall I went to climb Bear Mountain in northwest Connecticut in the very early morning. I hike a lot by myself but for some reason this spot was giving me the creeps. It was just barely light out and the woods were thick. All the leaves had fallen and it was dead dead silent. It really reminded me of the Blair with project. Now I hadn't been on this trail before so I was going slowly and looking around taking it all in. As I walked I was shuffling the leaves with my feet just to make some noise so it wasn't so eerie. That's when I heard what distinctly sounded like a rattlesnake. It made me jump back but then I got to thinking it was pretty cold in fall and there's definitely no rattlesnakes on this little mountain. Those things live in the desert. I was just creeped out altogether and figured I was hearing things. I continued with my hike and then went home. It wasn't until a week later I was reading about the mountain I had climbed. They had a website with a taxonomy section. That's when I saw it. There was rattlesnakes on that mountain. Even worse it went on to explain how they can be seen lounging on the warm rocks in summertime but in fall, they hide under the thick layer of fallen leaves to keep warm. The same leaves I was kicking. I got very lucky that day. I was at least an hour walk from my car and probably another half hour at the very least to the nearest hospital. I live on the east coast of central Florida and have my entire life. I love it here because of all the state parks and water that surrounds my town. Growing up my parents loved to take me camping, fishing, and hunting so I had a great appreciation for the outdoors. One place that we would camp at fairly frequently was the Princess Preserve. The Princess Preserve is a large piece of land on the east coast that has great fishing and more importantly, great camping spots. In 2015 me, my dad, mom, my uncle and his girlfriend, and my friend Taylor booked a Saturday night reservation at one of the camping spots at Prince's Preserve. It was the middle of summer and a great time to do some fishing so Taylor and I were pumped for the camping trip. We get to our reserved camping spot that Saturday and are greeted by a park ranger who was signing us in and just verifying that we were the ones who had booked the spot. While Taylor and I unloaded our camping equipment I overheard my dad and the park ranger talking. The park ranger said y'all sure picked a great weekend to come camping here. This is usually the busiest time of year but for some reason you guys are the only campers booked for tonight. Looks like you got the place to yourself. That struck me as odd being as we had camped here my entire childhood and every time we did every campsite was full. I wasn't too concerned though because it was time to spend the day fishing and cooking over the fire. Fast forward to that night and Taylor and I decided we were going to walk to the camp showers about a mile from our site. We didn't tell anyone that we were going to the showers so we just grabbed our backpacks full of soap, clothes, and towels and headed out. When we reached the showers I took one first and then Taylor hopped in the stall while I dried off and got dressed. I was sitting on a bench right outside the shower stall when I looked up and saw a man standing in the doorway of the bathroom about four feet from me. 
He was about 5'9", had medium-length messy blonde hair, strikingly blue eyes, and was wearing a light blue shirt with jeans. I immediately locked up with fear because I remembered the park ranger saying that no one else was camping tonight and the park's gate closes at sundown. The guy and I just locked eyes for about 10 seconds and he turned around and walked out. I opened the shower stall door and told Taylor that we had to leave right now because someone just came in the bathroom who shouldn't be here and no one knows we're over here right now. Within 30 seconds Taylor had his clothes on and we ran out the bathroom. The guy was nowhere to be seen which was strange because outside of the bathrooms there was a crazy bright floodlight that lit up the entire area about the size of a football field. We were obviously freaked out, but we had to make the mile walk back to camp. Up ahead of us about 300 feet was a fork in the dirt road and we had to take a left to get back to the campsites. Right on the corner of that fork was a oak tree with palmetto bushes surrounding its base. As we got closer I noticed a weird shape in the palmetto bush. I told Taylor but he claimed he didn't see anything. When we got about 20 feet from the bush I saw it. The man in the light blue shirt was crouched inside of the bushes. I told Taylor that the guy was hiding in the bushes but for some reason he claimed he couldn't see him. A couple seconds later we made the left turn and I was only a foot from the bush. As I passed it the guy was literally staring at me in my eyes with just a deadpan face, absolutely no expression. I was so close to him I could have touched him. I started hyperventilating and told Taylor that if I started running then he needed to run too. He must have thought that I was just trying to scare him. I honestly don't know why I didn't just start running as soon as I passed the guy but maybe I was just a young and naive. We were about 40 maybe 50 feet past the bush when I heard a twig snap behind us. I turned around and saw the guy running full speed towards gripping something large behind his head like a big stick. I immediately ran for my life and turned around to see if Taylor was running or not. He was just standing still, obviously confused. Directly behind him, I mean literally just a foot or two, the guy was bringing down what I thought was a stick but now I could clearly see was a axe, down on Taylor's head. Thank God Taylor's instincts kicked in and he let out the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard in my life and took off running. The guy's axe missed his head and slammed into the dirt road. We kept running the mile back to camp and looked behind us the entire time expecting to see the guy chasing us but he wasn't. When we got to camp no one was next to the fire or in their tents so we ran down to the water to see if they were fishing. My mom, dad, uncle and his girlfriend were all down at the water together. We told them what happened and they just laughed saying that we must have snuck some alcohol or smoked some weed in the bathrooms and now we're just paranoid. Taylor and I went into our tent and just laid in silence all night listening for footsteps. To this day Taylor hasn't been camping again. I still go camping though, and I've even went camping at the Prince's Place Preserve dozens of times since then hoping I would stumble upon that man so I could kill him myself. I was 15 that night and I'm 27 now. I still can't wrap my head around what happened but I can say with confidence that the guy was planning on murdering my friend and me. We got extremely lucky. Bit of an intro to get to the actual spooky part, but I hope you read through it. Back when I was 12 or 11, I was on day trip out in the woods with my dad kind of a secluded area no people lived around for miles, and the trail itself wasn't maintained anymore. We saw no one else was there per usual, as no other cars were there. A little while later probably a good mile and a half in from the entrance, we stopped walking to relax for a little bit. I had found a nice solid stick during the walk and was fooling around with it. There was a semi-rotten stump where we had chosen to sit, and I discovered hitting it with the stick actually made a really nice, deep, thunk noise. So I hit it a couple times couple times, hit rest, hit hit rest. Following that pattern. 
After a few seconds I realized there was an echo from far off, even deeper in the woods. Not too weird as there was definitely enough stuff in the area that would bounce the sound back. So I kept messing with it and my dad joined in too. In total it was only about 5 to 10 minutes of playing with the stick and stump, and we stopped and decided we're gonna grab our stuff and head back. Then from deep in the woods again came three distant thunk noises. It couldn't be an echo at this point. We looked at each other confused and were wondering what it was. Like I said, other people being this far out in this spot was very unlikely. But then the three thunks came again much closer than they were before. We grabbed our stuff and booked it out of there. Still don't know what exactly it was, had it been a person, they would have been sprinting to move that quickly between sounds. And if it was a person, why were they coming right for us? Never been back to that area since. I suspect many people will not believe this, but we used to have this tradition that my dad, brothers, uncle, and cousins would go camping over spring break in Bankhead National Forest in Al. This is a really neat spot where a natural spring run into a waterfall that we always call the sippin' spot. To get there you have to carefully climb a muddy sandstone wall to the top of the waterfall. It is very beautiful but not a whole lot of people know about it or can make the climb. One year we went up there and found an entire abandoned campsite that had obviously been there undisturbed for some time. It's almost like some time happened and the guy just left everything and walked out, but without his shoes, a radio, and all his clothes and food. We speculated that maybe a storm drove him out or maybe he had fallen to his death somewhere nearby, we never found anything. The strangest part was that we also found spikes set up randomly around the campsite and what I can only describe as a torture altar covered in barbed wire. It was just very strange. We had the rangers check it out, and they cleaned up the site, but never determined what happened. They assumed it was just a bunch of kids messing around, but I'm not sure. Still a very strange moment. Here's my story. My dad and stepmom had recently bought a retirement home in the Southwest and had been living there for a few months. Dad loved the idea of BLM land to hike on. Back home everything worth hiking is privately owned and they'll shoot you for trespassing. He found a few spots and had quickly scouted them on his own, but hadn't explored them in full yet. Stepmom wasn't the hiking sort. We decided to take the family and visit them for spring break week, which finally gave dad some hiking buddies to explore with. He was super excited about everything and very eagerly suggested one spot he had been too nervous to do alone so far. A place that had some cool natural rock formations. It sounded like a great idea and it only took about an hour to get to from his new house, via paved roads. We all jumped into his 4WD truck and headed out. It ended up being a very beautiful area and we pretty much had it all to ourselves. We explored a bunch of stuff until around dinner time, when the kids grew hungry and it had also started to rain. It had been a fairly uneventful day so far and we had hiked slash explored for many hours, so we decided to drive back to his house. Dad decided he would take a scenic, back road to get home. My dad had always had a very good sense of direction, so we didn't question it whatsoever. After a while of driving, however, it was clear that the road was not much better than a pothole ridden two track, winding through the muddy hills. We started wondering if dad had early stage dementia for choosing this awful road. There were some spots where the road was very dangerous, especially with the rain. The truck kept slipping on the hills and our maximum speed was around 8 miles per hour. It got extremely nerve-wracking. It was also taking forever at those speeds and the sun was setting. Our kids kept asking are we there yet, like Donkey does to Shrek. Oh, 
And did I mention that we didn't have any cell service the whole time we were out there? After driving well over an hour on this two track, we came to a crossroad that wasn't on any map. It was now just past sunset and we were concerned about driving through this unknown area during the dark. Unsurprisingly, it didn't take long to weigh the pros and cons of taking the mystery road. It was clearly in much better shape than the two track and didn't appear to be anyone's private driveway or anything. So we decided to take it to save what was left of the truck's suspension and hopefully get everyone back to dad's house before full dark. We hadn't seen another car or person since we left the hiking area. But we did see some free range cattle and the road had widened so we felt better and better about our decision to take said unnamed road. The sun had sunk deep below the hills and the sky was quickly changing. As it does in the desert at night, but we could see something on the horizon, dead in front of us, that looked like a cloud. As we drove on the cloud grew in size and we all realized something was on fire. After just another mile we could also see flames. It was a house on fire, or rather, a trailer house slash mobile home. It looked like someone's permanent residence, sitting about 150 yards away from the road. We still didn't have cell service. None of us. By the time we got to a well-used driveway in front of the fully engulfed home, we could see other signs of current habitation. A mailbox, a second house trailer not far from the one on fire, a sedan parked about 100 feet from the blazing inferno, a small tractor, a windmill, a shed. Dad and I got a very bad feeling. There were no houses anywhere nearby. We hadn't seen another car or soul in hours. We couldn't get a signal to call 911. If someone was trapped in there, we might be their only hope. My dad screeched to a stop, threw the transmission into park, and without needing to say a word to each other, he and I decided to jump out leaving my husband, kids, and stepmom behind in the idling truck at the end of the driveway. Dad and I could instantly feel the heat on our faces, even 100 plus yards away from the blaze. The roar of the fire sounded like a freight train, but there were no other sounds. The sky was now pitch black, and it looked quite at odds with the incredible light emanating from the inferno. The flames had to be at least 30 feet tall. Dad and I jogged up the driveway, yelling. Hello? Anybody there? Is everyone okay? And that's when we heard the blood-curdling screams. Upon hearing the wailing voices, we looked at each other for a split second and instantly broke into a full sprint towards the fire. We ran as fast as our legs could go. It sounded like two young children, maybe behind the blaze somewhere. They screamed over and over. And we were yelling back, saying things like, We're coming. We will help you. When we heard another voice. A man's voice. We were probably only about 20 yards from the house and were holding hands in front of our faces because of the heat. We couldn't see him at first, but then he seemed to materialize between the fire and the shed. He was calmly standing off to the side approximately in the same direction as the screams. The firelight made it hard to see him clearly, but he looked like a middle-aged white guy, thin, wearing jeans and a long-sleeved shirt. He was also holding something long, like a shovel or a rake or a stick. Or maybe a rifle. No. It was a rake, certainly. Or. Geez. We couldn't tell but it made us freeze in our tracks. His voice seemed very calm and without shouting he could clearly be heard over the roar of the fire. It's all right. Those are my birds, he said. And just then the screaming stopped. Dad and I stood there, dumbfounded for a second. The man repeated, it's all right. I have this under control. And just then I heard another scream. And it really did sound more like a bird, now that he said it. This bird scream was followed by a very clear and normal sounding peacock call, 
emanating from the same direction as the previous screams. It clicked for us. By this time if anyone or anything was still in that house, they were long past saving. And those screams did kind of sound more like birds than children. Okay, my dad said. You sure you're okay, sir? Yes, the silhouetted man very calmly said after a few seconds. Everything is fine. Thank you for stopping to check. We got the distinct feeling he did not want us there. And he was still holding the, uh, rake in his hands. So after another awkward silence, we cautiously took several backward steps, then turned and quickly walked the 150 yards or so back to the truck. We didn't speak to each other on the walk. It was like we were both too afraid and shocked to process it all quite yet. We quietly got into the truck and were peppered with loud questions from our family. I remember neither of us answering, just fastening our seat belts and my dad trying hard to nonchalantly not peel out of there. We both felt very uncertain. As we drove back to dad's house we all talked through the details and pretty much talked ourselves into believing it was just some random guy calmly watching one of his trailers burn to the ground for whatever reason. So had we basically walked into a crime scene? Surely not. No. Being not from the area, I left it to my dad to alert the authorities once we got back to his house. We followed the news for weeks afterward. No missing persons, no foul play. I hope to this day that it was just some lonely hermit and his peacocks and tropical birds, but I think I'll always feel unsure. I have always loved the woods. Ever since I was a small child I have found more comfort in them than anywhere else. It wasn't until my adult life that this changed, it all started on a normal camping trip during a cold November weekend. Most people would have cancelled the trip due to it recently raining and with a high of 37 all weekend long however I enjoyed the extra challenge. The trip was to Mammoth Cave National Park in South Central Kentucky. For those of you who aren't in the know, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave system in the world with a beautiful national park full of amazing trails and places to go canoeing and all your other favorite outdoor activities. That is of course on a surface level. Many locals know not to go on the north side of the park at night alone or even in a small group. Quite a few people have gone missing over the years and very seldom is it on the south side of the park. The park is split down the middle by the Green River which stretches across the park from east to west connecting Nolan Lake and Green River Lake, both of which being popular spots during the summer for camping. Everyone's uncle had seen Bigfoot in these woods, heck I'm sure that they also shared a sandwich a time or two. I've never believed in the paranormal, I think it can all be explained away by logic and reasoning. Saw a ghost? Yeah right that's just your brain imagining it, did that light turn off on its own? Sure, might want to call the electrician to fix the crappy job the first electrician did while the house was being built. In saying that, I will admit that I do enjoy a good story, especially creepy ones found across the internet, especially those of the local urban legend across Kentucky of the Goat Man or the Barilla. For those who don't know what the Barilla is, it is a local legend in South Central Kentucky about an animal frequently seen at Native American burial grounds and local cemeteries at the edge of small towns. It's described as having short black slash gray fur with a massive waist and even larger arms. It didn't get the name Barilla for nothing. Its head is being described as that of a large wolf with long pointy ears, amber eyes and a short stubby snout. Some have described it more along the lines of what a stereotypical werewolf would look like. And for the goat man well we have all heard that tale before I don't think it needs any introduction. Anyways back to the camping trip, I was going alone this time. I thought about bringing my son along as he had just recently turned 13 and I felt more comfortable taking him on longer harsher trips with minimal gear. He always seemed to enjoy camping but this was out of his league 
It was too cold and the trail was too harsh and unforgiving for anyone without proper experience. The trip itself was over the course of two days. The first was hiking up to the site which was set up on the highest point in the park. The next was of course a slow hike back which in all honestly would be even more dangerous due to the rapid drop in elevation combined with the cold slick mud and clay that would be found on the trail. I always made sure to pack lightly on hiking trips like this to really push myself when it came to my survival skills. On this trip I carried with me a small knife, two 50-foot strands of 550 paracord, my tent and sleeping bag and some iodine tablets to purify the water of any harmful bacteria found in the water, a small flashlight really only strong enough to illuminate 10 to 15 feet in front of me and then of course a fire starter and duct tape. Overall I packed more than I normally would for such a trip however with the recent birth of my second child a few months ago I started to take less risks and packed more each time. For food I brought with me a pack of beef jerky and some granola bars, that's really all I needed to feed my slim frame of 150 pounds at 5 apostrophe 11. Time came for me to leave for my trip, getting in the truck I felt a cold feeling wash over me. Like a sixth sense telling me not to go on this trip but I ignored it, I had already taken off work for the two days I would be gone and I'm not about to waste the few precious vacation days I got each year. The drive itself should only take three hours depending on the ferry still used by the park. The ferry was the quickest and easiest way to get across to the north side of the park without adding an extra two to three hours onto the drive. It was a common complaint to those who came on vacation from out of state. However us locals usually took the chance to catch up on a new book or to double check our gear in case we had forgotten to pack something while waiting for the ferry to reach the south side boarding dock. I was currently reading a Game of Thrones for the third time. Peace Danny is like 14 you perverts. It took the ferry only 45 minutes to get back on the south side but when the crew stepped off they went to each of our vehicles to tell us due to the increase in wind and with the currents being strong today there would be no more rides across the water today. Anyone wanting to get across would have to go around and take a bridge across, the closest one being an hour and a half drive away from the docks. This at the time had upset me however I understood why they couldn't risk the journey across to the other dock and so I went on my way. It was a fairly long and boring drive, there was no use in bringing my cell phone due to there being no signal anywhere in the park even on the tallest peak of the park you would get no signal. Yes I know what people are going to say you should still bring your cell phone when going out camping and to that I agree but I hated the distraction of it. It always pulled my attention from nature and I also just didn't want to deal with another piece of equipment I would need to keep track of. Remember in my mind the lighter the better. Originally I had planned to get to the parking lot at the beginning of the trail by 9am however it was now noon and I only had about a good 7 hours of daylight left. This meant I wouldn't be able to make it to the camping grounds at the end of the trail by nightfall. This isn't the first time this had happened to me however I always hated it when it did. Hiking up the steep incline even in perfect conditions at night was dangerous and heavily advised against by park rangers so I would have to make do and set up camp at the first area I could find after sunset started and wake up early tomorrow to catch up on the three hours I've lost due to the ferry. The first three hours of the hike went perfect, I saw a timber rattlesnake. If you ever visit the eastern United States watch out for those. Not only are they big and strong for a snake they are also very and I mean very venomous. Once I had hit the 5 hour mark on my hike I had run out of water for the second time and needed to refill my bottle since this was the last chance you get until you make your way back down. I was going to go for another 30 minutes or so before I made camp. There is a nice clearing up ahead that if I can get to then I will be in good shape to make up for the lost time tomorrow. While refilling my water I noticed a paw print in the mud 7 feet off to my left on the bank. It was undoubtedly a canine print left from where what I presumed was a coyote coming to stop for some water sometime in the last 24 hours. That was until I got closer to the print and realized just how massive it was. 
Now I'm a smoker. I smoke around a pack a day and well this print was two packs long and slightly bigger than one pack wide. Let me translate that for all the non-smoking readers. Whatever made this print was massive. There's no way a coyote made this print, but there aren't any wolves in Kentucky. There's also no dog breeds I know of that have prints that big. Whatever made this was massive and well I had no intentions on staying here by the river and wait for its return. I hurried back on to the trial this time with more pep in my step so I could hurry and set up camp to offer some protection if whatever the thing that made the print was still around. I made it to the clearing and set up camp just as the sunset was starting to fade into dusk. First I quickly set my tent up and threw my sleeping bag inside followed by starting a fire. If there was a predator out there in those woods the fire would keep them at a distance for a while at least so I thought. I next used my two strands of 550 paracord and tied them around the campsite at knee level to act as a tripwire for anyone or anything coming onto the campsite to give myself a few more precious seconds of time to react. I finally sat down and tore into the pack of jerky I had packed. This gave me some comfort and relaxation as now I had food in my stomach and a fire to keep me warm. Then I heard it snap. My blood went cold as my mind went a million miles an hour as to what could have made that noise. Was it a person? Could it just be some sort of animal like a deer just passing through? What if it was that creature that made the pint back down at the river? Whatever it was it was large and heavy as I heard twigs snapping louder and louder as it drew closer. Who's out there? Announce yourself. No answer came. I have a gun and I will shoot if you don't announce yourself it was a lie however it was a bluff that had gotten a response countless times over the years however still no answer came. Whatever was making these noises was heavy, it had to have been several hundred pounds for it to make twigs snap that loud like they were bones being broken with each and every step. That's also when I noticed just how much distance the creature had covered in only a few seconds. Whatever it was, it couldn't be human. Its pace was too slow for the amount of ground covered and the steps were too loud and powerful for it to be a person. Some time had passed before I heard anything else, the steps had stopped just outside of the light my fire produced. Whatever this thing was, it was smart and understood to stay out of the light where it could see me and I couldn't see it. And there we stayed for what felt like an eternity, Unmoving trying desperately to stretch the little bit of spare wood I gathered to keep the fire going as long as possible. It was waiting for the fire to die out, but I wouldn't let it. I couldn't let this thing get its chance to attack me in the dark. I knew if it really wanted me all it would have to do is come right into camp and have me for dinner but it never came. Some time had passed and the fire had come to its small desperate final breaths of life when I decided to head into my tent thinking the creature had moved on to choose another target. That's when I saw it, those awful amber eyes, cold without emotion. They struck utter fear into me, this creature was massive. It had to have been at least 8 to 9 feet tall, I couldn't see the body, it was too dark for that, but those eyes. Those cold terrible eyes will haunt me for the rest of my days. I still see them to this day every night laying awake and in my sleep. I quickly turned my flashlight on and saw the large lanky frame of this beast. Its dark black fur covered up what was undoubtedly an impressive and horrifying amount of muscle for its build. That's when I realized the putrid stench that had come with it. In my fear I had not noticed the foul smell of death and rot that followed this creature. It only took the smallest moment to react and drop down to all fours and let out the lowest, most awful growl I ever heard. It could be felt in my soul the anger and hatred this thing possessed could only be described as pure evil incarnate. I quickly hurried into my tent and hid for the gruesome end that was about to come my way praying not to any specific deity but anyone or anything out there who could hear me. I do not want to die, I do not want to die please God save me I do not want to die. I heard the creature approach right up on the tent sniffing and growling at me, 
I swear I don't think my heart had beat a single time. What felt like hours had passed without a sound. Then it was gone. Its howls could be heard off into the distance reminding me that I was lucky to not end up as its supper tonight. I did not sleep for even a second that night. How could I? I had just experienced the face of pure evil. Malice itself given form into our world. I knew I should not be alive and that the only reason I did not die that night was by its choice and that alone. When dawn broke I exited my tent and found evidence of the creature all over the campsite. Pieces of fur, paw prints and claw marks on nearby trees just to name a few. This trend continued on the trail back to the car, I never made it to the end of the trail. As soon as I packed up camp I hightailed it out of those woods. I knew if I was to encounter that creature again I would not be so lucky next time. When I got to the car I threw my backpack into the back seat and hurried into the front seat of the car not saying a word. I sat there in silence with my face in my palms. When I looked up I saw its amber eyes staring at me looking at me with a pleased expression on its face of the terror and trauma it had just caused me. This thing. It was intelligent. It wasn't after me to kill or for sport. It was after me to make me suffer. Like human suffering was its way of feeding. The look of pleasure on its face. That grin with its long terrible yellow teeth showing. God why is such a creature allowed to exist in this world? What grave sin have I committed to be tortured by this thing's existence? I started the car's engine and drove off. Driving well over the speed limit. Every now and then at a stop sign I would swear I saw those amber eyes but each time when I looked again they were gone. When I got to the north side of the park's dock I waited there patiently as the ferry slowly made its way back. When the crew finally came up to my car they stopped and remarked how pale I looked, like I had seen a ghost. I knew they wouldn't believe my story so I brushed it off as the cold weather taking its toll. I rode home in silence. The radio was turned off and I was left to my own thoughts racing through my mind about the creature. When I arrived home late that night my wife had already put our daughter to sleep. My son was off at some friend's house playing Halo 3 having a good time. I sat there on the couch contemplating what had happened out there on that trip. I decided to head to bed soon after. When I had opened the door my wife Sarah had remarked that I stunk and if I had been sprayed by a skunk. My blood ran cold, I smelled it too now, that awful putrid stench. I made sure not to make a face and dismissed her claim and went to take a shower. As I got done I looked out the window and there it was. Illuminated by the street light with that insidious grin on its face. It had followed me home and saw the fear on my face, oh the joy that must have given it. It's been two months since that camping trip, every night it returns. Sometimes brushing up against the side of the house, other times staring through the window and others howling in the distance. It made sure I understood it wasn't going anywhere. I had done some digging online and found out the creature was the Barilla, it had other names as well like Dog Man and the Beast of Bray Road. It's been three more months since I found out what this creature was. I've been in contact with God knows how many experts to try and rid this thing from my existence. Each attempt became more and more desperate and with each attempt the dog man's pleasure grew it knew I was desperate to rid myself of it. I cannot keep living my life this way. When you find that I will be gone by the time you find this, just know I love you and I'm sorry. I will not give this creature the pleasure it seeks so adamantly. I am sorry. I love you all and when you read this please sell the house and move as far away from Mammoth Cave as you can. When it learns I have killed myself it will come for one of you next. I was the lone park ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. The nearest town from the guard station was about 1.5 hours away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors, bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. 
The woods there always had an eerie feeling to them. Unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. This district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run, I always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about 3.5 to 4 feet in the air. To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling get the F out of here. But the eyes only crouched down, and inched closer. At this point, I could tell it was a large animal of some kind, definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area and the creature leapt back a bit but did not make a sound. Toss four or five more pieces and the creature still inches forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys. Of course, the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grabbed my shotgun, technically, you are not supposed to have guns in government housing, but who the F lives in the hills have eyes back country and does not carry. I went outside. The creature was a bit closer. I still could not get a good look with my bad headlamp. A loaded shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, the trail crew came up, and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. My uncle was a park ranger. He always told the story of when he worked in Montana. He was a solid 10 miles away from town, so pretty much ball deep in the woods. He recalled pulling his ATV on top of a semi-big hill that overlooked a valley. In between all the trees was this clearing he could see through his binoculars. Through them he saw an older lady, 60-ish, in black surrounded by a pack of six to eight wolves. Now, he is a lengthy distance from the woman, but he starts yelling and honking and all that and takes off down the hill as fast as he could, but when he reached the clearing, there was no one there. No wolves, no women, only a silver ring with a black stone in the middle. He still has it to this day. I have been a park ranger in the United States Forest Service for almost 15 years, but this took place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. It's weird since wolves aren't known to be in the area, but when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize anything is possible. Thank God. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places where it had been sighted. I wandered around for about three hours, no further calls during that time, until I took a break for water. I sat down, had a snack, drank some water and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet away, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had a collar, so I whistled at it and he came over to me. Getting a closer look. I could see it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it'd be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog freaking took off. He was playing to see how far he could get me to chase him, typical dog behavior. I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through the woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand, 
the dog finally slowed down near a rock bed or creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first, then I noticed it, the overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But, honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, who died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone, she called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunk into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continue to be in disbelief, in a way. But I know what happened. 1. 1. 1. 1. I was doing some stuff in Death Valley National Park as a park ranger, and a couple of summers ago I left via the opposite direction of the construction crew, so this is a second-hand story, as we were all leaving after a very long night of pouring concrete, they should have been done at around sunrise, but things didn't finish up until like 1 pm or so, the archaeologist, let's call him Art, saw a faint glimmer of silver in a bush. He turned around to retrieve it. Thinking that it was an old balloon, a huge problem don't release balloons, they always come down somewhere and end up as litter, he turned around to retrieve it. Instead, he found a German man sitting there under the car's windshield sunscreen thing with a piece of rolling luggage by his side. This was an area that was closed off to the public until the road was repaired and nobody would be back through until the next day, so he stopped to talk to the man. Apparently, the German man, Claus is a good German name, let's use that, had been dropped off by his wife and mother-in-law the afternoon before and was in the middle of a long hike, like 20 to 30 miles or so. He had been hiking all night and was taking a break to rest during the day. There were plans to meet up in a day or two, but the women were in Vegas at the casinos. After some discussion, Art learned that Claus had no food or supplies and had only drank a few sips from one of his three and a half liter water bottles since he began the trek, he thought rationing it would be best since he only had a small amount of water. The temperature was already in the 120F range and Art had to explain that the guy could not stay there or he would very literally die. Claus said that he would be fine because he had trained by sitting in a sauna a number of times before he left Germany, and plus, how would his wife know where to pick him up if they left? After explaining the difference between sitting in a sauna and hiking with no food in a dry desert, Art proceeded to ask what would happen if his wife's car broke down or if she got delayed for some reason. There is no phone service in that part of the park, and nobody was supposed to be in the area to begin with, so Claus would be Saul if his wife didn't arrive. Claus finally agreed to jump into Art's truck and drive to the nearby town, 20 miles away. As soon as he got into the AC of the truck and took a few sips of cool water, Claus realized how hot his body actually was and that he was actually in pretty bad shape. When they got to the town, they actually found Claus' wife and mother-in-law in the parking lot of the only gas station. It turns out that they had broken down there and never made it to Vegas. After talking a little, Art had to get off to sleep, he had been up all night, and reminded Claus to grab his roller suitcase from the back of the truck. Art casually asked what was inside, and Claus opened it to reveal a suitcase full of water bottles. He was so delirious from the heat that he forgot the heavy bag that he had somehow been rolling across the desert was full of water. Delirium like that is a sign of sunstroke Claus probably wouldn't have made it through the rest of the day had Art not insisted on him getting into the truck. 1. 1. 1. 1. I have a friend who is a park ranger. He's basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. 
He told me about this time he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well, so he said he was going to head back as it's a one-hour ATV ride. He was finishing up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind that he's far off the beaten path. He called out, and no one replied. As it was getting dark, he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start. He then noticed that the battery was not connected anymore. He reconnected it and started to drive, but it wasn't going fast at all. A little less than a half mile later, the whole thing died. He radioed back, basically saying hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would, but it would be an hour. He asked if the other guy got back, and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire, but before long he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed they had to be less than a 1000 feet away. He radioed again and they said they were having trouble finding what path he might be on and hadn't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they were because he left with the iPad, that had the map. They said he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them, hoping maybe they can stop being drunk assholes and maybe have a map. He walked in their direction but the voices seemed to be getting further apart as he got closer. Finally, after 20 minutes, he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call and they said the other guy was found passed out covered in vomit and was being taken to the hospital, but he crossed off everywhere they found a stand, so they have a general idea where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. He decided to listen to what they were arguing about, Picking up things like well it wasn't yours to take and I don't care. You knew better and so on. He assumed it was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something intelligible, then silence, then, bang. A gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that, he heard nothing. He just breathed for the next half hour until he saw the ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour, a shallow grave was found and in it was a long dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. The thing was, it was a skeleton who had been there for years. So either the argument he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. Back in the early 90s, my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a national park ranger. This was the opening day of deer season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile from any road or trail, I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently. They'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old, the kitchen confused me, but I figured they had left because hunting season had started, so I just continued on my way. That night, I was telling everyone about it when Scott got serious and asked me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him, he warned me not to go back there and to be glad no one was there. Apparently, some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth so they wouldn't blow up their houses and to make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops and they raided it a couple days later. I must have missed it, but the guys had set up multiple trail cams, which were damn expensive at that time, all around the area. Based on the pics on them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed, while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface, it seems like a well thought out plan by some smart people, but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently, they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. 
The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking the meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area. They ended up getting 20 years in prison. Not me, but my dad, who was a ranger. He said once he was out in the forest with one other ranger, they had to camp overnight halfway to their destination. Well, that night they heard footsteps, and a lot of them outside their tent. Then they heard at least 20 people scream get out. Needless to say, they got the F out and radioed it in. The next morning, the cops went out and searched and found four skinned animals pinned to the treats around their campsite. Small chance I'm the cause of one ranger's story from about a decade or so ago. I was hunting on public land with my dad, several miles away from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on. The weather is bad and I'm not hearing distant gunshots, so I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm going to head back, and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. 20 or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just messing around, putting stuff in my bag while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag, I thought I heard that faint bass of someone yelling, so I took an earbud out and noticed that, crouched on the opposite edge of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger kind of just watching me. I stood up but didn't wave, and I wasn't sure he had even yelled at me in the first place, so I didn't holler anything at him. We just kind of locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal, my rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open, and we were following all laws and regulations. I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie, and radioed to my dad we've got company. My motives weren't nefarious, I just didn't want my dad to come bumbling down the hill and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. When I looked back up, maybe 15 seconds later, that ranger was gone. I mean, flat the F out gone. So eventually, I meet back up with my dad and start to tell him about what happened. Yeah, as deep back in here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good, and hit the trail when he saw you on the radio. They get ambushed like that. As someone who gets nervous? Anxious? I never occurred to me that I could be causing similar anxiety to them. If you're reading this, DNR bro, I'd like to offer you a heartfelt me bad, and keep up the good work. I used to be in a group that's somewhat like scouts, so we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird thing happened often but most of the time it was easy to explain. One thing happened, though, that to this day scares the living s out of me. I was a leader for the age group, 8 to 10 years old, and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year we stayed on that terrain and it was huge. Normally we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive, so we were aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time it was impossible. Every camp we have what we call a night game. It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks while the leaders scare the ever-loving us out of them. Obviously, we had one too during that camp. We masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints, I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage, so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees, so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and makes you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there, I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times. I couldn't see it very well, 
So I just assumed I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end and I saw the shadow again. This time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare the kids and decided to go over there as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree and while getting closer, I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread. Something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay, but they didn't respond. The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless, I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree, and I noticed he looked like a male. He was barefoot and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud. His hands were in a weird, cramped position. I was convinced this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank, so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank, it felt like I was in serious danger, so I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me, but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite and every single person that could be dressed like that was already there. They couldn't have gotten there before me and if they did, they sure as hell didn't have the time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them that they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them, and we left it at that. The next day, I wanted to go check it out. Who knows, maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case, and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree, where I saw the person banging his head, and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops. They looked around quickly and brushed it off as just a prank by another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. We didn't notice anything weird after that, so it probably was a dumb prank, but seriously, some people have a messed up sense of humor. Edit. This has had a lot more responses than I thought. To clarify, I'm 99% sure it was a prank by locals. The cops reacted in a way that looked more like not this BS again than oh no, evil murderer in the woods and we won't stop it. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogulone to Snow Lake when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rock makes it hard to stop they went over the edge and high centered. We're miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring, and the nights get pretty damn cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. From off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, a fanny pack, and a purple velvet sweatsuit that's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and he tells us he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet suit, it was like a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious and wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around 9 in the morning and the only way he could have gotten back to where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy is a goofy man and just points off toward the other mountain when asked where he's staying or going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road and goes off into the woods. The ranger told us he couldn't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he'd made it. 
We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger popped by to tell us that nobody at any other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit. That range rolled off duty the next day, and his replacement came by to make sure the other ranger was smoking something we gave him. We assured him it all happened. I never heard another word about the German in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but it makes for a good story. I texted my buddy that was with me the day to reminisce about the German, and he reminded me that the purple pimp German looked a lot like the actor Reese Ifans, who played Nigel, the kicker in the Keanu Reeves classic The Replacements. I hope that helps with the mental image. The movie came out like three years after the camping trip, but we remember seeing the movie and thinking Nigel looked just like the crazy German. My friend reiterated how absolutely happy the German was. Not a ranger, but an avid mountain climber here in the Philippines. One time, my group went on a night hike to a mountain located in central Luzon. Naturally, we took the easier trail, North Peak, since we were hiking with some newbies. At around 4 a.m., we broke camp and started our descent. Almost an hour in, we noticed that we kept passing the same fallen tree and the same boulder. The trail was very straightforward, and many of us had climbed the mountain before, but for some reason, all of us were going round in circles. One of the more superstitious hikers decided to make us all stand in a circle, utter a prayer, and leave an offering of food. Only then were we able to complete our descent. So here are a few of my hiking stories. This was around 2015 when I went on a day hike at Mount GB, somewhere in the southern part of the Luzon area. The week prior to my hike, I was in the same area with a friend. Seeing that the trail is relatively straightforward, we decided not to hire a guide. Fast forward to the present, I decided to do a nighttime trek with five of my colleagues in tow. Since I was the one who knew the trail, I was the group leader. We heard something that went, shh, 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 as we were hiking the trail. We looked around, thinking it might be one of the locals, some parts of the trail led to small houses. Anyway, it soon stopped, so we forgot all about it. We soon reached a narrow part of the trail bordered by shallow cliffs on either side. Since I was the lead, I was very focused on the trail, and I didn't notice that my colleagues were lagging behind until one of them said, Hey, why don't you shine your flashlight right in front of you? I stopped walking and waited for them to catch up. When we reached the campsite, I asked my colleague why he told me to shine the flashlight right in front of me. Well, he whispered, you were walking so fast I didn't think you saw the child standing right in front of you. Second story. We were walking on our way home from the summit of Mount B, also in southern Luzon, when a kid came up to us asking if he could guide us for 5 pesos only. He was dressed in a blue checkered shirt and white pants. He was very well groomed, his clothes were wrinkle free, and his hair wasn't even messy at all. We knew the trail by heart, so we kept on declining his offer. Eventually, we agreed, since we figured he would follow us anyway. When we started to walk again, he suddenly stopped following us. I called out to him, but he didn't mind me. He just stood still. I looked at my companions and they were very scared. So I said, okay, stay there if you want, but you won't get your five pesos. And left. I told this story to fellow mountaineers and they told me the kid was probably the child of one of the guides. This is a very popular urban legend surrounding a certain Mount C, also called the Devil's Mountain. The famous legend narrates the story of a couple who went on a hike on Mount C at midnight. They got lost when they accidentally took an unusual trail on their way to the campsite. Even though the weather was threatening because of a storm and there was zero visibility, they still continued their hike. They arrived at a point where the trail forked, and they turned left when they should have turned right. The left was a deadly trail, so they never made it to the campsite. According to local folks, 
the two were not found until now. Third story this story is connected to the previous one, also taking place in Mount C. A group of hikers, together with a guide, went on a rarely used trail. On the way, they passed by a small village, where the elders advised them to continue the trek but leave the only girl in the group at the village. They politely declined and continued hiking. Halfway through, the guide told them that he could only go as far as the first half. Being experienced hikers, they paid the guide and continued until they came to a fork in the road. As they were debating which road to take, a couple stumbled upon them and told them to take the left side. They continued following the couple even as it got dark and started to rain. Suddenly, their flashlights turned off simultaneously, but they still tried to follow the couple. When the rain stopped and their flashlights came back on, the couple was gone, and one of the group members slipped and almost fell from a ravine. I was out camping with my dog one night along the Mogul Lone Rim of Arizona. It was dark and we were sitting around the campfire when we heard something behind a bush close to our camp. Instead of my dog barking at it, he begins to whimper. I didn't think anything of it and just tended to the fire. After a couple of minutes, we heard some more noises from a different bush. This time, my dog gets up and goes over to the tent and scratches the door because he wants to go in. I tossed a couple of rocks in the direction I heard the noise and nothing happened. I'm spooked now, so I toss a couple of pieces of wood on the fire and climb into my tent with my dog, hoping that the light from the fire would keep whatever was out there away. We eventually fell asleep and luckily had no other disturbances during the night. The next morning, I went out behind the bushes where we had heard the noises and found mountain lion tracks that were circling around our camp. I'm sure glad I didn't go looking at night when I heard the noises. When I went backpacking at Philmont, Boy Scout Place, every crew started out with a ranger that went out with the crew for the first couple of days just to make sure that they were going to be okay and had the necessary skills to get to their destinations. After they left the cruise, they would head to the nearest staffed camp or pickup location. Our ranger was telling us about one of his hikes back after leaving a crew. He followed along a game trail since they are usually easy ways to get through the woods, and as he was walking, a mountain lion walked up behind him and then scented him like a house cat does by rubbing against your legs. When a mountain lion does that, apparently, you involuntarily defecate and urinate in your pants and then hope to God the lion was just in a playful mood. As it turned out, this one was indeed just messing with him and he made it safely back to camp. I'm not a ranger, but back in 2010 I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter. During the summer, the snow melt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged, and decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a four-mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears. They should be sleeping, but if they aren't, it means they are hungry and I'm for dinner. For this reason, I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 down to the river and I figured, worst case scenario, I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hyperthermia. It's a crazy plan, but once you're out there you realize bear spray is kind of useless inside the tent. So one early morning, I hear these loud animal noises outside my tent, they are getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent. I just froze and the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point, I could hear it sniffing my tent. I didn't dare move, I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent, but it's still out there, 
and now I hear more than one animal. I finally poked my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear though. It was probably the most scared I've ever been out camping. One. 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 I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four-mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power this property was right next to where the park started. To call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night, I had been hearing noises in the woods, what I thought was someone walking but then they'd just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door, and the owners didn't want me to install one, so I began sleeping in my car. Now, this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin and where I was hearing something. I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out. My roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed not once, but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion triggered cameras. There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up to the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us. I was camping in a campground on the west coast. I have back problems, so when I camp I sleep in the car. I had the back seat converted to a bench seat and put my sleeping bag there. I cover the car windows for privacy. Early one morning, I heard this rumbling sound. It's loud enough to wake me up. I'm a child of the suburbs, and what it really sounds like is when you push a shopping cart across a really rough parking lot one with a lot of gravel sticking out of the concrete. Then the car gets bumped hard. The whole car moved. I immediately start unzipping the sleeping bag with the inside zipper, but that's not the quickest process. By the time I get free enough to sit up and look, there's nothing there. But some big animal had walked by, and I love to know what made a rumbling noise like that. I was in an area of old growth. Most of the area had been logged a long time ago, but there was a fire that destroyed the temporary logging infrastructure that they had built and it wasn't economical to rebuild it, so the old growth remained. We had been hiking with day packs all day away from the main camp and had crossed the creek several times, and crossed paths with two cotton mouths, each nearly getting us, and eventually followed the path away from the creek but you could still see it to the big but sparse evergreens. We were uphill from the creek about 150 when we came around a corner and, bam, there was a wild black Russian boar. As big as a large cow with bristling hair, 8 to 10 long. At first, I thought it was a cow. A big, dirty cow with a weird head I stopped in my tracks. It took my non-woodsy companion a moment to figure out why I had become stuck in the path. We stood there for a while, waiting for it to finish eating, and then wandered away and around another corner. The whole time I was thinking, I wonder if I could reach the creek, full of big rocks which I could scramble onto and then across the creek, first or would the boar? I knew that I would beat my buddy even if he started running first. All the way back to the campsite, any and every dark spot or shadow was a moccasin or a wild Russian boar. I was 14 years old when this happened. So I'm in a boy scout troop from a small town and every year we connect with a neighboring town and plan a big camping trip to a place called Panther Den. This was my first year going and it's basically a four hour drive south where we park in a lot and hike down on Friday night about a mile and a half in the dark with our backpacks full of gear for the weekend. Panther Den is part of a state park, so it's mostly woods, but there is one area near a creek bed that is empty enough for us to set up camp. As we are hiking down the trail to get to the camp, I am near the front when I see something in the dark. At the time, I thought it was a tarp in a tree, but really, as we get closer, we see it's a tent. 
We stay a respectful distance away as some of the adults walk up to try to talk to them and ask if they'd be okay with us setting up camp near them. They go up to the tent and, after a few minutes of repeatedly asking if anyone was there, we just decide to set up camp and we'll deal with it in the morning. We set up camp and go to sleep. We woke up early the next morning to check out the site. There is a tent with a clothes line and an empty fire pit. There are some clothes on the line and some clothes on the ground. The fire pit was cold when we got to the camp that night, and there was a pot of water that had long been frozen. The tent holds two sleeping bags and some more clothes, and also a few papers. The clothes on the line must have been wet, but they have frozen solid now. We spent the entire weekend camping and rock climbing, having a blast and seeing no one. The tent is never claimed and nothing is ever moved. There is no sign of anyone claiming anything. We later find, via the papers in the tent, that it presumably belongs to a woman, whom we find on Facebook and message about the tent but never receive a response. I still don't know what happened to the tent or where it even came from. People couldn't have gone into the woods without sleeping clothes because the warmest it got all weekend was 45 degrees and it reached below zero at night. Once, when I was younger, I went camping with my mom, my sister, and her new boyfriend. I woke up one night, after not being able to sleep as usual, and went into the car so I could play on my phone without waking anyone up. Eventually, I noticed our dog on the riverbank a little ways ahead of our campsite. She was pretty small despite being part pit bull, imagine a miniature pity, which made me worried about her being alone in the dark. She shouldn't have even been outside of the tent, so I went out to go see what she was up to. She was staring intently at something on the other side of the river, which was not too wide. It was a figure. I ran back to the car because I was little and I'd seen enough scary movies to know the dangers of spooky figures in the woods. My dog followed me into the car, and I locked it and stayed in there for the rest of the night. The thing is, I kept seeing him. He would be watching us, day or night, on the other side. I couldn't quite make him out except that he was wearing a hat and was most definitely pale skinned. I didn't want to tell anyone because I didn't know if it was real. But my dog always noticed him too. My mom's boyfriend was laughing and talking about how there was a homeless guy taking stuff from our garbage at the campsite, and he didn't tell my mom because she would have freaked, which she did, scolding him for not telling us. I guess whoever I saw was probably the same man. The grandchild of some farmers from the good old county of Cornwall in England here. There are massive woods surrounding my great-grandfather's home, and only one really nearby neighbor who lives a little down the road. Exploring these woods was a load of fun when I was young, and I would do it all the time. I don't know if you could call it hiking, but when you got deep into the woods, civilization disappeared. After going with my family a few times, it was decided I had a pretty good head and was allowed to go out on my own, I was about 14 at the time. There were no dangerous animals or anything in there, so we went on an adventure. I kept a good track and never got lost, and after a couple of days exploring, I found a path emerging from the bushes. Now. This was further out than I was technically allowed to go, but I was 14 and broke rules. This was interesting to me because there were only two paths I was told about, and it seemed very cold and faded past the big mangle of bushes. I couldn't tell where it was on flat ground, but it seemed to remain a little on the long slope to the top of a hill. I happily went up this hill to the top and found something really strange. There was a tea party set up in the middle of the forest. Seriously, plastic chairs, a plastic table, a teapot, and teacups made from China. This weirded me out like crazy, but at the time I sort of dismissed it. Two years later, after I'd grown up a little, I went looking for the plastic chairs and table. I hadn't really mentioned it to anyone yet, but I'd realized just how weird it was and I wanted some kind of proof. The plastic chairs had been scattered, by some animal, I assume, 
But what was really weird was that the plastic table was ripped almost in half. I couldn't find the teacups or teapot anywhere. I later went back and talked about the tea set, and everyone seemed very confused. There were no kids anywhere, and the only kids who had grown up there had been my great-grandmother and her siblings, who certainly didn't lug a weird tea set out there. Everyone promptly forgot about it, but I'm still weirded out to this day. It was like something from a fairy tale horror film, now that I think about it. My whole family, like nine people, went for a drive to my grandfather's favorite mountain. He recently passed away, and we took my grandma because she wanted to go. It was a caravan of two trucks, on a muddy dirt road near the top of the mountain. We stop and get out to look at the view from the top of the ridge. I'm about six years old, the youngest in the group. Everyone makes it to the top before I'm even halfway there. They stare in silence. My brother breaks the silence by saying hey to me as he scoops me up before I can reach the top and see the view. He carries me back down to the trucks. Everyone is murmuring and taking pictures, and I'm whining about never being able to do anything fun. I found out what happened about 15 years later. The photos from the trip were in a family album. I asked them about the mountain and the view I wasn't allowed to see. My mom explained to me that once they reached the top of the ridge, they saw a steep mountainside covered in these large, perfect black circles, as though the grass had been burnt. That's why they were shocked. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid. I was terrified of natural disasters and stuff. My older brother knew this and stepped in and directed my attention elsewhere, so I didn't flip my stuff while the other adults took pictures. My brother was the best. Anyway, the pictures of the circles came out black or blank when they developed them. No one had a picture that showed the perfect black circles. The other pictures were fine. I've done a ton of hiking in my area, mostly solo, mostly overnight. Several years ago, while in college, I was stressed out and had just finished fall semester finals. So I decided to go hiking to clear my head. I went to an area I am very familiar with. Having always felt at ease there, I figured it would be a great spot to recharge. I also enjoy night hiking, so I didn't mind pushing on past sundown. But just when the sun set fully and everything turned winter gray, I started to hear things. I know those woods, I know them all year round. I know where people live, where the roads are, where the campsites are, where locals go to smoke weed and get laid, and that those are the places where you run into trouble if you don't have a car. I started hearing bicycle bells, chimes, clicks, and voices that couldn't be there. I assumed it was like a white noise hallucination brought on by stress. I acknowledge hearing them to prevent denial from exacerbating the issue. Stress was manifesting in a different way than usual, so I just let it happen and hoped it would pass. Soon after the peripheral vision hallucinations began, I am used to some weird shadows and my brain making up things in the blending gray of twilight. That part is physiological, not paranormal. I acknowledged that and continued, wanting to make it to some pioneer cabin ruins to camp in. I had stopped to eat lunch there once and thought it would be an inviting place to hang a hammock. The auditory hallucinations changed to voices, which bothered me. The visual hallucinations, previously only present in my periphery, began to linger when I focused my eyes on them. Then they began to move toward me. I closed my eyes to try to reboot my vision and center myself. But my eyelids may as well have been glass. I could see right through them and could still see the gray woods, gray figures, and gray houses as well as if they were open. So I prayed. I asked for clarity and protection. I received the reply immediately, knowing that I would be watched over until I left the woods, but only if I left soon. The mountain I was on was the highest in the area and at the edge of the escarpment to the Blue Ridge, so there was some cell signal to be had. I knew I didn't have time to walk the 12 miles back to my car, so I called a friend to come pick me up. 
The trail intersected the road at the top of the mountain, so I hiked along the road for a few hours before he got there. I've been back to the woods, even to that part of the trail, and I feel safe there. I still see peripheral figures at twilight. I still prefer to hike by myself, but I know better than to think I truly hike alone. Two stories. First of all, this happened about three years ago or so. We were all hiking near Pinehurst, California. I can't remember the exact trail we were on. But about five miles from the trailhead, we see a couple of packs strewn out in the field. Like somebody was exploring the cliff face just beyond. We get a little concerned, but go on our way. We're returning four days later to find the bags are still there. We check it out, and find some well-prepared packs, meals lined up day by day, clothes the same thing, a couple of bottles of Jack, one almost empty, two unopened, and a few boxes of ammo. Things looked like they hadn't been touched since we came through four days prior. We marked the location on our map and reported to the ranger on our way out. I kept checking online for reports from the area but never found out what happened. Second story this was probably 15 years ago. I was about 13 to 14 and doing a 50 miler over the course of a week. This was in the High Sierras, Norther Kings Canyon area. We're doing switchbacks down to a lake for the night, and about halfway down this horrible smell of death permeates the air. As we get closer, we see a half decomposed deer just off the side of the trail. Insides hanging out, rib bones sticking out, the worst number of flies. It was obviously all a bunch of 15 year old kids could talk about that night around the campfire. We all get ready to sleep, and around midnight, we're all woken up by some kid blowing his whistle as loud as he could. We all freak out, start blowing hours, and wave our flashing lights like crazy. Finally, everyone calms down and we look around to see what was going on and a bear had come through the campsite looking for candy that this kid had left in his bag and didn't store properly. We're all now on bear watch duty for the rest of the night. But nobody could sleep because their adrenaline was through the roof. So, I have a story about being in the woods. When I was nine, my mother wanted to go hiking at a state park close to where we lived, and this would be the first time my little brother or I went hiking. We took two water bottles each to the park, but we ended up only bringing one when we went on the actual hike. My mom checked the time on her cell phone before we walked in, it was 10 AM. After she checked the time, she led the way onto the trail. It was really beautiful in the woods, like those types of woods that fairies would live in. We all finished our water and followed the signs on the trail, but we still weren't finding our way out. My mom went to check her phone to see if she had any cell service to call for help, but her phone was black and would not turn on at all. We walked for what we felt was maybe an hour or two at most since we started, but we really couldn't tell without a phone. My mother noticed a trail that could lead to the highway and help us get back to the car a few minutes later. As soon as we stepped out of those woods, I could hear my mom's phone go off and it scared the crap out of me. My mom looked at the phone and was shocked that it said it was 6 PM. It was an hour away from being dark out, and we would have been lost in the dark if it wasn't for that trail. The scariest part, however, was the fact that we had passed that section of the woods three times because I remembered seeing this misshaped rock with moss and a red polka dotted mushroom. When I saw it for the first time, I told my brother that's where the fairies play, and it cheered him up. Every time we walked past that rock, not once until the last time did my mom or any of us see a trail to a road. My brother and I never wanted to go on a hike, but my mom said it would be fun and forced us to go. I'm just glad we made it out alive, but I'm sure as hell never going hiking again. Sorry, this isn't in a park or while hiking but it was a walk in my neighborhood, kind of like a hike. Anyway, from my house, there's a medium-sized field down the road, 
wrapped with a sidewalk. The field is like a place for soccer games and other various things like that, and there's a playground in the corner. Trees every so often along the sidewalk. In the back corner of the park, the park was also encompassed by a brick wall, there was a little gate that you could just unlatch and walk through. So I do, because I like exploring. It leads to a canal that runs along our freeway. I went here often when we lived in that house. I would just escape everybody and sit by the canal and watch the water flowing through, with my dog by my side as we relaxed in the morning sun. I stayed away from the tunnel for the canal, the canal just kind of goes underground for a moment to go under some train tracks, because there was a lot of gang riding there, but that doesn't even play into the creepy part of this story. One day, I decided to walk down the rest of the canal and see if there was anything interesting I could find. Suddenly, my dog decided she was really not fond of the brick walls next to the canal. In this area, the park has ended, and it is now the back of houses that face the canal, with the brick wall behind them. So basically, house to brick wall, to canal, to freeway, is the scene. Anyway, I stare at this house that my dog doesn't like for a while, then look at the ground, as there was something odd there. A cat skeleton take a bit closer look. It's not just one cat, there were about four or five cat skeletons that looked like they were just chucked over the brick wall of this house. My first thought is that a serial killer is in the making here. It was the most unsettling sight that I think I ever came across. We left instantly, and I only rarely went back to sit by the canal after that, until we moved. I probably should have reported it, but I was only like 11 years old at the time, and didn't think that would be a reportable thing, probably isn't. Do you ever notice how many trees there are? I've heard it said there are more trees than stars in our galaxy. Amazing to think about, isn't it? That something as big as a star should be outnumbered by the trees on our planet, in our galaxy at least. That's a lot of trees, and they're all very old, aren't they? So very old. Older than us. Maybe, somewhere out there, is a tree older than the dinosaurs, buried in a mountain, somehow having survived millions of years. I know we find fossils of trees, but what if those fossils weren't dead? It's interesting to think about that there could be a tree out there older than all of mankind's history. Do you think trees have thoughts? After, trees are alive, and every living thing has some kind of mind, an intelligence driving it. And if so, what do they think of us? I've got a fair idea of what they think about humankind. I'm a park ranger. And this is my story. It all began when we got a call none of us had been wanting to receive. A child had gone missing. This wasn't unusual. People go missing all the time in the parks. However, what made this one unusual was how it happened. Maxie Patton had been out with his mother on a picnic. At 13 years old, he was a wild and rambunctious child. And if there was one thing he loved doing more than any other, it was climbing trees. If only he'd been more of a video game kid than an outdoors kind. Perhaps all this could have been avoided. You see, it was when he was climbing a tree that he disappeared. His mother recounted everything in detail. They picked out a nice clearing on the edge of the woods, near a large clump of trees Maxie could climb on as he pleased. We set up the blanket right here. Maxie wanted to climb that big pine tree. She pointed to it. I took my eyes off him for only a moment, she sobbed, just one moment, and when I looked back, he was. Then she utterly broke down. The first thing we did was check out the tree in question. It was a pine tree, one of the tallest I'd ever seen. Clearly, it was very old. How high up was he when he vanished? I asked his mother, a little skeptical a kid could just disappear without a trace while climbing a tree. He was. 
was halfway up. Then she continued sobbing. After that, it was obvious we weren't going to get anything else out of her. Still, I walked around the tree twice and I could clearly see the snapped branches and twigs where Maxie had climbed up. They ended at about halfway up. It was like he just stopped climbing then disappeared completely. We did a thorough search of the area first and found nothing. Well, almost nothing. See, about 50 yards from the pine tree, I found a shoe, covered in pine needles and tree sap. It was red and blue, a Nikki brand symbol on the side. It seemed to have been there for a long while, but when I bent down and picked it up, what I found inside planted the first seed of doubt that this wasn't just a case of a woman losing track of her child. There, written in black permanent marker, was a name. Maxi Patton. So how did it get here? Maxie's mother was hysterical and became even more so when I brought the shoe to her. That's it. That's my Maxie's shoe. She grabbed it, clutching it close to her chest as she wailed and wailed. We had to take her away. Taking the shoe from her was difficult, both physically and emotionally. That woman held the shoe to chest like it was a baby. I'll never forget how much that woman cried as she was taken away. Sad to say, but the shoe was the only evidence we had of Maxie and where he'd gone. She was escorted to the park center where she'd wait for the paramedics. We know that she wanted to help, but in her condition, she'd only be a hindrance. The moment she was out of sight, however, was when one of my partners spotted Maxie's blue shirt at the top of another pine tree, hanging from a branch by the collar. A hundred yards in the opposite direction of where we'd found a shoe. He swore up and down that the shirt hadn't been there when we'd first looked, and did so with such conviction, that none of us doubted him, even if we wanted to. We knew we had to get that shirt down somehow. It was evidence. But then again, how had the shirt gotten up there? Unlike the pine tree Maxie had disappeared from, this one had no sign of anyone having climbed on it. No broken twigs and branches slightly bent from where someone had climbed up and left the shirt. There were five of us when we went to first look for Maxie, excluding myself. We didn't think we'd need that many, because frankly, people go missing in the parks all the time. Often, they'd turn up in about a few hours. But we'd never dealt with something like this. Starring up at that shirt, covered in pine needles, I think it began to dawn on all of us that we were dealing with something we weren't trained for. We radioed for backup while trying to figure out how to get the shirt down. I volunteered to climb up. The very first branch I grabbed, however, broke in half instantly. In the process, scratching me across the hand. I cried out, looking at the gash across my palm. It wasn't deep, but the skin had been broken. Blood was already pooling in it. Groaning at the sharp pain, I clenched my hand into a fist, trying to stifle the bleeding. I glared, stunned, at the large branch which had just snapped when I touched it. My blood was already seeping down it and towards the ground, where it dripped onto the exposed roots of the pine tree below. Crap, I cried turning back around to the others while clutching my wounded hand in my still healthy one. Park rangers always carry a first aid kit on hand, and they quickly helped me apply bandages to it, wrapping my hand in cotton. What happened? One of the other park rangers asked me, looking at the broken branch ludicrous. It just broke, I snapped back despite myself. My agitation at having been cut by the tree branch when it broke was severe, but then something else dawned on me. How had that tree branch cut me? It broke in the grip of my hand, and shouldn't have been able to move in such a way as to leave a mark this painful. Inadvertently, a shiver went down my spine. I became acutely aware of how many trees were around us. Was I mistaken? or had their number increased since I'd last checked. 
I had to be mistaken. We need to split up and find Maxie, another park ranger said. I was thankful, given it meant I didn't have to focus on the trees anymore. What about the shirt? Another said, indicating the garment at the top of the tree. We'll come back for it later, the first one said dismissively. You know, it's strange. For the life of me, I cannot remember their names. See, I was still new at the time, a rookie really. I barely knew what I was doing at the time. I never saw any of the other park rangers involved in the search for Maxi Patton again. Most of the retired or transferred to a different park. But sometimes, I do wonder if we all came back from that search. We split up into three pairs, moving in a perimeter from Maxi's last known location. The pine tree. I was paired up with a man whose name escapes me. I just know he was Hispanic, and that's all I can ever remember about him. We were sent north, in case Maxi or whatever was left of him, had somehow gotten there. The others went east and west. If we found anything, we had to radio it in and then come back. If we found a body, we had to leave it undisturbed. That was obvious, of course, but I really hoped we wouldn't find anything. Because what we'd found so far just didn't sit right with me. How did his shoe get 50 yards from his last known location? As I thought back to the moment when I had found that shoe, I began playing it over and over in my head. Something was nagging me about it. Hey, pal, said my partner. What? I replied. You ever climb trees as a kid? I nodded. My face was beaming as I thought back to those happy days. When my partners grimaced, however, I blinked, confused. What's wrong? Shaking his head, my partner muttered something in Spanish under his breath before he answered. I did too. A few times. But. He stopped walking and turned to face me. One time, when I was climbing a tree, something happened. What? I asked, curious if this had anything to do with our current search. It was back in Mexico, before my family immigrated to the States. There was a tree in my abuelo's backyard. I climbed it every time I went over. One day, when I climbed to the very top, I was looking out over the entire land around my abuelo's house. I felt like I was king of the world. Then I saw it. Saw what? My partner didn't answer. He opened his mouth, paused, then slowly closed it, shaking his head. You wouldn't believe me. Try me, I replied. He sighed then, opened his mouth to say something. When his eyes widened so large he looked like a fish. He was looking at something behind me. Furrowing my brow, I began to turn around when he grabbed my arm in a vice-like grip. Don't, he hissed through clenched teeth. Don't look. I couldn't help myself. I wished I had taken his advice when my eyes found the blue shirt of a young boy hanging from the bottom branches of a tree with a broken branch, probably about a hundred meters away. Blood was dripping from it onto the roots below. My heart began beating in my chest so fast I thought it would burst. That's impossible, I muttered, then blinked. What I saw the moment my eyes opened will forever haunt me. The tree had come closer. My partner began cursing, letting go of my arm and stumbling back. He crossed himself, saying silent prayers. We have to go, he said with a shaking breath. Now. I didn't argue. Instead, I began running, my partner right next to me the whole time. I didn't dare look back once, and neither did he. All thought of finding Maxie was gone. For all intents and purposes, he might as well not exist. At that moment, all that mattered was getting away from that tree. Exhaustion caught up with us eventually, though, and we stopped, panting as we tried to catch our breath. Did that just happen? 
I said through my painful gasps of air. Did that actually just happen? I don't know. Amigo, said my partner. Did you see it move? I asked him. No, he answered. But I saw the others moving. What? Their branches and leaves were moving, he answered. You heard that, right? I nodded. By this point, I was thoroughly done with everything, for lack of a better term. This was just too crazy. I was watching them for a while, he continued, wondering why they were moving with no wind about. Then. Then. What? I asked him. He looked me grimly in the eyes. I saw a boy, he said, the branches moved aside, only briefly, but I saw the body of a little boy. He couldn't have been more than 13. But. Amigo, we mustn't find that body. I didn't want to ask. But curiosity got the better of me. Why? Because that thing could never be called human. Not after they're finished with it. What do you mean, finished with it? My partner didn't answer. Instead, he began praying again in a shaking voice, crossing himself over and over. What was happening to Maxie's body? I pressed, not consciously. He didn't answer me at first. Instead, he licked his lips, looking around us, eyes darting from one spot to another. When he spoke, his voice was low and shaking. The same thing I saw in my abuelo's backyard when I was a child. I didn't say anything to that. I just sat on a stone, leaning backward until my partner grabbed my shoulder. Don't, he whispered, there's a tree behind you. I didn't need to look to know he was right. It was obvious anyway. We hadn't left the forest, after all. What do we do? I asked him. I kept my eyes on his face intently, because looking anywhere else meant seeing a tree. Ignore them, he answered firmly, they might leave us alone if we do. So we did. We just sat on the ground, facing each other, catching our breath. I could hear the singing of birds, the gentle flow of a stream nearby, but the only thing I could pay attention to was the sounds the trees made. The soft creaking of wood, the swaying of leaves and branches on this windless day, the trees brushing against each other. Neither of us said anything, just looked at the ground to avoid the awkwardness of staring at each other's faces for who knows how long. The silence between us was marked by our tense patience. Something was going to happen, we could feel it. Even after running from that thing for God knows how long, I didn't believe we'd escaped it. It was still out there. Waiting, just like us. I've heard stories about how some hunters track their prey. They shot it first, critically wounding it, then follow the blood trail it leaves behind, waiting for it to collapse from exhaustion. Why bother letting it put up a struggle when you can wait it out? I remembered those stories when I looked at my hand. The cotton around my palm was soaked a crimson red. Why is this happening? I asked my companion. He said nothing, just stared at the ground. I've never heard of this before, I continued, my voice dull and tired. I've heard stories of Bigfoot, Mothman, even freaking Dogman in Michigan. Some people say they've seen aliens, others, goblins and fairies. And they always say they see them in the woods. Peeking around a corner, watching them. Hiding behind something, like a rock or a... A. I couldn't say it. Because they were still all around us. Listening. But I've never heard of anyone being hunted by a tree. When I said that. I don't know why I did. I guess accepting the reality of what was happening would make it easier. It didn't. Because when my partner looked up at me suddenly, I could see it in his eyes. He was disappointed in me. I was talking in the presence of other trees. I didn't care. This was just too weird. Any rational part of my brain was long since dead, 
unable to deal with how bizarre this was. I wondered if my partner was going through the same thing. Then again, he claimed to have experienced this thing before. Are we sure they're trees? He said slowly, like he was talking to a child. What? I answered, and eyes narrowed. My father once told me a story. It was about a demon possessing a woman he knew as a child. He said she went stark raving mad, biting people and scratching her face. When he finished, I couldn't help but wonder if demons only possessed people. Are you saying a demon has possessed a tree and is hunting us? Maybe, he answered, who knows? I mean, how do we even know if that thing was a tree? Looked like one to me, I replied, trying not to peek over my shoulder to see if it was behind me. But trees don't move that fast. And they don't carry around pieces of clothing. They don't chase people. You said you saw them with a boy's body, I pointed out. My partner swallowed, crossing himself. I did, I did. I wish I hadn't, but I did. And let me tell you, amigo, trees aren't capable of doing what was happening to that boy. I didn't say anything. The sun broke through the leaf canopy above us, and I squinted from the glare. So did my partner. Part of me thought he made a compelling case, but another felt like there was something we were missing. Missing. That was it. When a tree falls, I said, and no one is around, what sound does it make? My partner furrowed his brow, confused. How do we know trees don't chase people down? How do we know they can't move in the blink of an eye? Or take a young boy without anyone noticing and carry away his body? What are you saying? That trees are capable of doing that? Maybe they are, I replied. Maybe we aren't the first to have seen them either. You think there might be others? When you were a kid, you saw something in your grandfather's backyard, right? Something involving trees? Through the sun's glare, I could see his face going pale. Maybe you were one of the lucky few to live and tell the tale? What? He said, mouthing hanging open. When a person goes missing in the savannah, some people believe they were killed by the local wildlife. And nobody doubts that. Africa is full of dangerous beasts. I let that sink in, let my partner begin to understand what I was going to say before I finished. When a person goes missing in the forest, sometimes, people assume they were killed by the local wildlife. Mountain lions, bears, wolves. But nobody ever stops and thinks about the trees all around us. Because nobody ever notices them. I pressed my lips together when I finished. My partner looked at me in disbelief and horror, dumbfounded. Do you have any proof? He said slowly. Same amount of proof as you do for demons possessing trees. Only a theory. Then my partner's face brightened with a dark realization. What if? What if we're both wrong? I blinked. My mind began racing with possibilities. What if we were both wrong? What if this wasn't trees or demons, but something else entirely? If it was, then. What was after us? I was about to say something when I noticed it. The shadow which had fallen between us, perfectly still on the ground. Like a border keeping us apart. A long, thick black line. One with several appendages sticking outward from it. My heart skipped a beat as my eyes widened. I knew my partner saw it when he cursed, screaming and backing away. However, there was one part of the shadow which made my blood run cold. One of the appendages was broken, and from it hung the silhouette of a shirt. And, slowly, very slowly, it was getting bigger. Unable to help myself, I began following the shadow's trail to its source knowing full well what had made it. I could just see it in my peripheral vision, like a patient hunter waiting for its prey to roll over and die when I heard the most comforting sound in my life. 
The distant hum of a car speeding down the road, passing us by. I turned back to my partner, locking eyes with him. At that moment, we both had the same idea. It was our one chance of getting out of this nightmare. Neither of us knew if it would work, but we didn't have a choice. Because the shadow had nearly doubled in size. And a tree was creaking. Very. Loudly. We ran, faster than I ever have in my life, before or since. We ignored everything around us, especially the silent, inescapable trees. We ran across their roots, pushed through their leaves, ducked under their branches, swerved to avoid running into their trunks. I didn't care if I touched them anymore. If I was fast enough I could get away from them. Then they wouldn't catch me. But what about that infernal creaking, always right on our heels? What would happen when it stopped? We couldn't be near it when that happened. Our very lives depended on it. So caught up in sprinting out of those godforsaken trees, I didn't think to look at my path. My foot hit something large and solid, and I cried out, losing my balance. My partner was in front of me, and looked over his shoulder, bewildered. He stopped and reached out his arms. I grabbed onto them and planted my foot back on the ground, pushing myself forward. Both of us kept running. We didn't need to check what I had tripped on. It was bound to happen at some point. We'd been running over them for ages. When we saw the gray asphalt of the road, my heart leapt for joy. The creaking behind us had become distant, growing fainter and fainter. I knew damn well we were safe the moment we reached that road. And that I felt something brush against my back. Something I knew all too well. The hard, rigid texture of tree bark. The next thing I knew, I was laying on my back against the burning asphalt, panting as I caught my breath. My partner was bent over me, his face obscuring the sun. There were tears running down his face. I saw it touch you, he said to me, weeping, it was so close, amigo, so close. I've never seen anyone run as fast you did. We're safe now, he began murmuring, we're safe. Praise the Lord, we're safe. I didn't say anything, just grunted as I pushed myself off the asphalt. I didn't remember even setting foot on it. My body ached and my lungs demanded oxygen, which I was only too eager to provide. I looked back at the woods we'd come out of. Marked by broken twigs and foliage pressed into the ground was the spot we'd both burst from onto the asphalt. Beyond it, I saw only trees. And not a single blue speck anywhere. I smiled, relieved, and stood up, glancing to the other side of the road and my smile vanished when I saw the blue shirt laying on the edge of it. The inside of the collar was facing me, and on the white tag was a name written in black marker. Maxi Patton. I blinked, and it was gone. I didn't tell my partner. He thought we were safe. Why should I take that away from him? Instead, both of us went back to the ranger station, tired, thirsty, starving. The other pairs had already beaten us to the station. When we arrived, they'd been trying to work the radio, but stopped when they saw us come in. Nothing happened to them. They didn't find anything either. They didn't ask where we had been for the last three hours. They knew better than to do that. Nobody ever tried in the days that followed, either. We didn't tell anyone about what happened. Some things are better left forgotten. A couple of weeks later, my partner resigned. He cited intense emotional trauma as his reason. I did the same thing three months later. I didn't keep in contact with him. He didn't try to. Instead, I moved to the city, surrounded by buildings and cars in the modern world. I avoid the parks, botanical gardens, Anywhere a single tree is, I stay away from it. 
I've always believed it was the only way to keep myself safe. I do enjoy going to a park my apartment overlooks. There are no trees there. Only grass and bushes. That is, until. I'm not sure what to do anymore. Because I had a dream last night. There was a pine tree in my apartment. And one of the lower branches is broken. I thought it was just a symptom of my trauma. Then I saw that tree in the park. And it's getting closer. I'm a wildlife ranger at America's largest blackwater swamp. Now I'm trapped here. I've been working as a wildlife officer at the Okefenokee State Park since 2010. It's a pretty great job, if I'm being honest. I've always loved nature, and being from the area the heat and humidity never bothered me. There's been some strange stuff going on lately though. The job doesn't involve a whole lot. Mostly just patrolling the swamps to make sure nobody is hunting illegally and keeping an eye out for any possible fire hazards during the summer months. Really it's just a peaceful place to be, assuming you keep plenty of bug spray on you at all times. I've been on the overnight shift for the last few weeks while the regular officer is out on paternity leave. Before he left he told me I would probably see a few weird things typical around the Florida slash Georgia line. Method out rednecks, kids sneaking off into the swamp to bang, and the swamp lights. The first two were typical on day shift too so I wasn't worried about that. The swamp lights threw me for a loop though. The lights are an old superstition. Supposedly it's spirits of lost souls that have died in the swamp trying to lure others to a watery death. There's a natural explanation for it though. Methane and phosphorus gas from the swamp mixes and gives off a glow. It actually looks pretty cool after the first scare it gives you. Those aren't the scariest thing that's been happening though. I was out on one of my patrols a couple of weeks ago in the big fan boat that we use to get around the areas where boardwalks haven't been built in, and I noticed something huge floating in the water not far from me. I steered over that way and focused my spotlight onto it. It was an alligator. Well, it used to be an alligator at one time. This one had been a monster, at least 15 feet long and built like truck. Looked like something that crawled out of Jurassic Park. It had been torn to shreds, gashes all along the length of its body, and the head was barely hanging on. Hey, Captain? I said into my radio. What's going on, Smith? The captain answered back into the radio. She was stationed back at the main office at the swamp entrance. We always kept at least two people on shift in case of any accidents or the rare wildlife attack. I've got a dead gator out here in section 14, I said back. I picked up a branch from nearby and started poking the corpse in the water, trying to flip it around and see if there were any other distinguishing marks. Probably just one of the older ones out there. Nature will sort it out. Captain answered back. Dead animals were nothing new in the swamp, especially with the amount of wildlife out here, but this was something I had never seen before. Negative, Cap. This gator is a giant, and it's been ripped apart. Ripped apart? By what? She sounded surprised, couldn't say I blamed her. Beats the crap out of me, I said. I still couldn't tell whether it had been torn apart by claws or teeth. The head had been ripped though, the skin was stretched and the bones were sticking out in jagged pikes. I'm getting the hell out of here before it comes back though. You think one of the bears might have done it? Old Methuselah has been a bit more crotchety than usual lately. Methuselah was a black bear that had been tagged in the swamp back in the late 80s. He was the oldest bear we had on record out here, and was somewhat of a local celebrity. He mostly kept to himself, and seemed to get along with most of the gators in the swamp, usually swimming along beside them most of the time. No way Methuselah could have done this, I said back into the radio. 
I'm heading back to the office. No, head over to the cabin. If there's something big out there I don't want you out in the open at night. Head in and wait until it's light out, we'll come get you. F. I hated the old cabins. We had a few spreads out throughout the swamp because of how large it was. Mostly they were used as ranger outposts now, but they started out as little hunting cabins back in the early 1900s. They were small, and up on huge stilts to keep them out of the water, plus to make sure the black bears didn't wander into them and make a nice little home. I headed over to the nearest one, about a 20 minute ride in the boat. The whole way over I was going over what in the world could have torn that gator apart. Usually they're pretty docile. There's plenty of food for them out here, so one wouldn't have any reason to attack a bear for food, and a bear is the only thing out here big enough to have done that. The only ones out here are black bears anyway, and they're more likely to run than fight. I coasted up to the cabin and stopped the boat fan, pulling it toward the nearest stilt and tying it down. With the sound of the fan not overtaking my hearing, I started to notice just how quiet it was. Usually there were cicadas, frogs, crickets, and all kinds of other wildlife making noise all over the swamp. Now I didn't even hear the usual owls in the trees. It was like everything had run away. Once everything was tied down I grabbed onto the ladder and started the climb up into the cabin. I pushed open the small trap door and pulled myself into the cabin. It smelled like mildew and dirt, but at least it was a safe place to sleep, out of reach of any dangerous animals. I looked around the cabin until I finally found the generator in the corner. Luckily we have someone come out to these once a month and replace all the gas and make sure nothing has chewed through the wiring. I would actually have light and some air conditioning so tonight wouldn't be too bad. That's when I realized the gas canister was mostly empty. They must have forgotten to hit this one last month. I still have a supply of batteries down in the boat and we keep some small lanterns around, but it wouldn't be nearly as good as having all the lights on the cabin. I looked out the window into the swamp, there was a bright light coming from about 50 feet away. It looked too bright to be one of the swamp lights. Hey captain? I said into my radio, you got somebody coming out to me right now? You and I are the only ones out here tonight, she said back. Ain't nobody coming out there until sun comes up. More lights started to pop up near the first one. They were spaced out, but all just as bright. There's lights out there captain. I think they're moving toward me. I tried to hide the shakiness in my voice. The lights were getting closer. Just hang tight, try to get some so the radio cut out with a high-pitched burst of static. Cap? Cap can you hear me? It was useless. The only thing coming through was a low buzz of static. I'm gone. I looked at my watch. It was only 11. 19 PM. I had at least 8 hours before someone would be out here. The scream started a few minutes later. It sounded like a child, the screams when a kid falls and scrapes their knee and don't know what to do about it. They were anguished. They were coming from the direction of the lights. F this, I said to myself. I'm not sticking around for this crap. I grabbed a lantern and the flare gun off the wall and pulled up the trapdoor to get onto the ladder. I practically jumped down to the boat, and started to unit it from the stilts. I reached down to the engine to pull the cord. It was gone. The pull cord had been cut off, there was no way to get the fan going. I'm stuck here. The screams grew louder, and I turned to see the lights only a few feet away. I hightailed my ass up the ladder. I could hear something ripping at the boat behind me as I closed the trap door. I heard the splinter of on of the stilts and felt the cabin sway. I've got my cell phone and my signal comes and goes. I'm going to try and keep updates going as I can. I've got every lamp in the cabin on and I'm sitting in a corner as far away from any of the windows as I can get. The screaming has stopped, 
but I can see the glow of the lights coming in through one of the windows. If you're reading this, send help. Part 2. According to the clock and calendar we keep in the cabin, I've been here for two days. Not that I would be able to tell, seeing as the sun hasn't come out this entire time. It's been dark since I got here that night. The only light I've seen is from those goddamn swamp lights out there, and they've been coming and going as they please. I still don't know what they are, but I know there's something else out there with them. I've been trying to sleep since I've been here, not like I have the ability to do much else. The boat is trashed, one of the stilts of the cabin is splintered, and I sure as hell can't swim out of here. I was looking out the window last night, between naps, and saw something moving between the lights that were out there. It was big, at least the size of a SUV. It around the perimeter around the cabin, walking on four legs. It wasn't a bear, I knew that. We didn't have any bears that size in the swamp. I hope to whatever gods are listening that it isn't a gator. I can't get too good of a look at it with how it's weaving in between the swamp lights, but I saw it knock over a tree on its way through. So, here we are, two days stuck in this hole of a cabin, surrounded by floating lights that scream, and whatever biological nightmare shambling around out there. I know some people asked why I didn't call the captain using my cell. You really think I didn't try that? I just get a busy signal. I've tried sending out texts and messages too, but they all just show read. I haven't gotten anything back. I really hope someone can tell the captain that I'm out here. If they ask, I'm in the section 14 to 18 cabin, out near the gator bog. Holy s. It hit me. If I'm near the gator bog then there's a boardwalk not too far from here maybe a mile or two. That will lead me directly out to the swamp entrance and the head office. I looked around the cabin and found the map that we keep of the entire swamp with all of our trails and stations marked. Okay, I'm in sector 14, and the boardwalk is a mile and a half southwest of me. Right over the Florida border. I'm going to have to try to sneak out of here though. Maybe I can make a paddle for the boat that way I don't have to swim. I looked around the cabin, taking inventory of what I have available. There are some battery packs, a set of radios, a flare gun, and the emergency rifle with 20 rounds of ammo, plus the lantern and a couple of flashlights, with glow sticks as backup. I think there's a backup or in the fan boat, but I'll need to check to be sure. The other thing I'll have to do is distract the lights and whatever that thing is in there. I may need to use either a flare or a few of the rounds of ammo. I don't think bullets will hurt the lights though. I thought it over for a few minutes. This was going to take some trial and error before I go anywhere, and I've seen what those things out there can do to the cabin, so they could break me in half no problem. I'll load up a flare and see what that does. I have six flares total, so one shouldn't be an issue. I loaded it up, stood at the window, and took aim at the nearest light. The flare shot off, the red light almost blinding me. Before it landed I saw it pass through the light. The light changed. It had a face now, gaunt, with hollow, black eyes. Sharp teeth showed from the twisted maw almost as if it was screaming in terror. I heard a roar of anger from it, and it shot toward the cabin, howling. I pulled the shutter, trying to close the window before it got here, desperately hoping that would keep it out. It banged against the side of the cabin and I could hear claws scraping against the wood. At least I finally had an answer to their state. They were solid, so maybe bullets could hurt them. Okay. I think I'm ready. There's a small propane tank under the camp stove in the corner. I can rig that to a flare, throw it out there, and shoot it as a distraction. Then I jump down from the trapdoor, land in the boat, and row my way out of here. I'm going to wait for a while and observe. 
That swamp light I shot at is still howling outside. That's a sound I'm never going to forget. It's... It's like a child screaming, but warped, as if it's being put through an echo and drawn out. God, I hope I make it out of this hell hole. The radio suddenly let out a burst of static. I could hear a voice coming through. Kason? Kason are you out there? Holy S. It was the captain. Cap? Can you hear me? I'm here. I'm in the section 14 cabin, I shouted back into it. The howling outside got louder, the clawing at the wall more furious. Kason we searched the cabin. You weren't there. Where the hell are you? What does she mean? I've been here for two days. They had to have seen my boat down there. Look, we found your boat back near that torn up gator. Just stay where you are, we'll find you. Captain, I'm in the cabin. I haven't left the damn cabin, I shouted back. I was panicking now. If they couldn't find me, what hope did I have? I think leaving is my only hope. I need to get the hell out of here and at least get back to the main office. From there I can at least been a little more safe behind some cinder block walls instead of this old rickety cabin. I have to go through with my plan. I'm writing all this into my phone and setting it up to go out automatically when I have signal again. If I don't make it, hopefully somebody can read this and find my body. I still don't know what the giant creature is out there, but I assume it's what tore up that gator the other night. I'll try and update again if I can make it out of here. God, please let me make it out of here. I climbed the stairs in the forest and still regret it. 13 years ago, I went mute and I am finally able to talk about what happened. From a young age, I was an extroverted and a stubborn girl. Although I always listened to my parents but that time, at 12 years I felt rebellious. My neighborhood held a Girl Scout camp. Every year, my parents didn't allow me to go, but this time I felt old enough which was my first mistake. Me and Kelly, my best friend begged our parents but they refused because they are responsible adults, who cared about us. But to us, 12 year olds they seemed like monsters. So, I made a plan. We told our parents that we are going to Katie's house for a sleepover. They talked to Katie's parents and we did stay at Katie's for approximately 12 minutes and then we left for our epic camping trip. Kelly decided on the place, Ludenberg Woods and that was our second mistake. Kelly and I have been best friends ever since we were little. Recently it was her birthday and I gifted her a unicorn bracelet which she never took off. Our neighborhood is surrounded by woods. The Girl Scout camp took place in the eastern part of West Area Forest. So we were quite far away. We didn't really have any camping gear just, two pillows, a blanket, a small Barbie tent, a flashlight, and some snacks enough for a day. We rode our cycles from Katie's to the woods. At first, everything seemed nice. We heard birds chirping and cars go by. The weather was nice and warm. We saw squirrels and rabbits jumping around. But as we went on, the forest grew thicker. We were tired of running around so we sat under a dark shaded tree, we ate our snacks and I tried to scare Kelly but what will happen next terrifies me to the core. As we started walking down the wreck trail again, we couldn't hear or see any animals. The only sounds we could hear were of the rustling of the leaves. There was an eerie presence in the woods. I felt uncomfortable and suffocated. And then, there was a sudden cloudburst. It felt like the whole woods were closing in on us. An ominous feeling wrapped around me. The trees looked like tall intimidating creatures. The peal of thunder startled us and both of us ran for shelter. In a state of panic, I realized that Kelly was missing. Fog surrounded me so I couldn't see anything but I could feel she wasn't here. 
After I calmed down, I investigated my surroundings and scouted for Kelly. As I said before where I live was quite warm but here it felt like it dropped about 10 degrees. Anyway, while walking down the path I noticed something. It was iron? As far as I know, that wasn't natural, why would there be human-made stuff so deep in the forest? I walked closer to it and in betwixt of the fog I saw an iron staircase. It seemed new, polished, and untouched by nature almost as though time had stopped for it. It seemed like someone had cut the stairs from a house and put them here. I was so mesmerized by them that it didn't even register to me that all the sounds were blocked off. At this point, I could hear nothing but my own breathe. Looking at the stairs I felt an unexplained morbid feeling to climb up them. At that time I felt like it was a must to climb, I had no choice. So I did, I started climbing them. With each step, I felt disconnected from reality. Nothing mattered. Eventually, I couldn't even hear my own breathe or was I not breathing? You may think that creepy sounds and screams are scary but no, silence, dead silence is the most terrifying thing that could destroy a person. This type of silence will make your skin crawl and make you want to rip your ears out. There was only the final step left between me and whatever lies beyond. The last thing that I could recollect was feeling a push. That's it, I fell and lost consciousness. When I woke up it was still pouring, even heavier than before. After I made sense of what was happening I felt like being watched, then I heard my name Rebecca in a low distorted voice. It didn't sound human. I got up and looked around and saw the thing that haunts my dreams. Every last thread of hope was shredded by this deep despair. What I saw was a thing, so horrifying that I can't even begin to describe it. It was tall and had two dark holes for eyes, a huge distorted grin which stretched from one side to the other. It had huge limbs with sharp claws covered with disgusting blood. I was petrified looking at it. It continued to say my name in a now childlike voice. It began to walk towards me repeating my name in the same disturbing voice. In a state of panic, I searched for a weapon and my eyes landed on a piece of wood. Without thinking I swung the piece of wood, hitting it until it was a bloody mess. After I realized what I had done, I ran away. I kept running and running. In my attempt at escaping that demon, I barely noticed the sounds of the woods. Panting and gasping for air I finally made it out and dashed to my home away from the deathly forest. I broke in and started crying hysterically. Kelly's parents, the Adams were also there talking with my parents. All of them shared the look of despair on their faces. There were cookies on the coffee table which were untouched. My once sugar-loving parents were now anxiously making phone calls. My angsty teenage brother was actually out of his room and nervously listening to the conversation. Kelly's mom, Mrs. Adams, who once was a fashion diva and always wore makeup, was rough and sobbing and even Mr. Adams, the most cheerful person I knew, was on the verge of tears. When their eyes met mine they were completely taken aback. Mom threw everything including the expensive new cell phone and ran towards me. They hugged me so tightly that it was hard to breathe. All my anxiety faded away when my mom brushed the dirt off my face. For a second everything was roses and butterflies until I saw the look on Mr. and Mrs. Adams' faces. I could feel hope blossoming in their hearts. Their hope was like a beautiful stained glass window which was shattered by the despairing news of the absence of their daughter. When they questioned me about Kelly my silence gave them the answer. I could see the color drain out of their faces. The forest rangers searched the entire forest until they came across a battered mess which DNA confirmed to be Kelly. It seemed she was beaten repeatedly with a blunt object. She seemed like an unrecognized pile of flesh. Kelly who once was a high-spirited girl, Obsessed with unicorns and nature was now a part of the soil. 
We identified her because of the bracelet I gifted her which was also covered with blood. Nearby they found a piece of wood covered with the blood of Kelly, which was likely the murder weapon. There was no trace of fingerprints, footprints, or any other evidence due to the torrential rain, giving an upper hand to the culprit. Now even after 13 years, they couldn't identify the perpetrator of this crime. I've told this traumatic tale to many but there's one detail I always fail to mention. After hitting the monster my eyes laid upon the lifeless body of my best friend, Kelly Adams. I'm the son of an army ranger. I'm also the army's greatest mistake. I always had a good relationship with my father. He was an army veteran, and I would love it when he recounted war stories about his time in the jungles of Vietnam or the deserts of Kuwait. He would always tell me one before bed, about his time as an army ranger, when he led his team to liberate villages, negotiate hostages, and crush rival troops. He was my hero. When I grew older, I already knew that I wanted to go into the army. I ate to fight terror and be as much of a hero as my dad was. I had trained for years to be in pristine shape when I turned 18. I put in all the effort my dad did to achieve his level of prominence. Night blindness. The inability to see in dim light or at night. So I couldn't see as well in the dark. I was ready. But the army decided that I wasn't. And with that, my lifelong dream, along with the work I put into it, was crushed. I was just about to walk out the door when I felt a tap on my soldier. I spun around to find an army ranger standing in front of me. The ranger looked down on me, an impressive feat for a six feet seven inches guy like myself. He had a solid, but weathered face, and a graying five o'clock shadow showing to be the only visible hair on his head. He had to be in his late fifties to early sixties, but his eyes showed otherwise. A hawk's eyes burned holes into my own as I stared up at the man. Could you come back with me, mister? The ranger stopped for a second to check the forms I had filled out at the start of the examination, before barking out, Ferguson. I followed him to one of the back rooms of the facility, where I sat facing him and a young Asian man in a white lab coat labeled Dr. Andrew Lee. The doctor stared at me and spoke, so Mr. Ferguson. Walter is fine, I interjected. He looked at me almost non-amused and repeated, so Walter, we see that you are in pristine shape to serve our military. However, it appears that you suffer from extreme nyctalopia which forced us to not be able to accept you into the nation's military. There is, however, another option. I looked at him, now intrigued. What is it? Dr. Lee answered, the army is looking for ways to healthily increase the performance of soldiers. You would make for the perfect test subject. Would you be willing to join it? For a second, I hesitated. I thought that maybe I shouldn't do this that I should just walk out of this building, become an engineer, get married, and forget about being in the army. But my father's face flashed into my mind, and I knew that there was only one answer. Of course, sir. It would be another three months before I was flown out to an undisclosed military base in the middle of the wilderness. I know that said base in the US, but I could not begin to tell you which state it was in. As soon as we arrived, I was strapped to a gurney and wheeled to a room that looked exactly like any other hospital room, minus a window. Understand that by hospital room, I mean horror movie hospital room. The ones where the light is always on, yet it always seems too dark. Where the white walls always seem gray and the room's door doubled as a heavy-duty locking system. It was safe to say that I was immediately regretting my decision. As the door was locked behind us, Dr. Lee reached into his medical card and revealed a syringe filled with, from what I can guess, 1000 milliliters of a clear liquid. As I strained my eyes to look at it, 
I noticed the word Prodigy 3 written on the side of it. The doctor inserted the needle into the crook of my left arm before unstrapping me and leaving. Everything felt fine at first, but my body started aching about half an hour after I was administered the drug. It honestly felt like my body was fighting a war on itself. It felt foreign, yet it felt natural at the same time. My arms felt too long but too short. My legs felt like they were growing stronger than ever, but they are feeling as weak as cooked pasta at the same time. My entire body just felt right and wrong in every way possible. That is the only thing that can give justice to what I experienced. After I was given a meal, I prayed. My dad was not only an army veteran, but he was also a deeply devoted Christian. My faith is another part of him that rubbed off on me. That night, I prayed for the sick and the elderly, but I prayed for answers too. Answers to this experiment. For example, what was the point? What was happening to me? Why? No answers came. The same thing happened the next day. Wake up, get injected with Prodigy 3, eat, relax, pray, fall asleep. My schedule may have been common, but the side effects of the medication were not. All that was happening to me was that I was getting taller and stronger, but it just felt wrong. I understand that my body was changing, but it wasn't changing the way it felt like it was changing. The way it felt, it was horrendous, like my molecules were individually splitting apart. I have no idea how long passed before the cut. It seemed like a normal day until I noticed that the medical cart was bulkier than I remembered. I watched him reach on the cart and pull out a wolf's skull and a knife. I was suddenly afraid. I thrashed in the restraints as he moved the knife closer to my head. I passed out, right before the knife touched me. I woke up alone. The only comfort I had was my dinner. I raised the navy bean soup to my lips to notice that they're further forward than normal. I lifted the metal spoon to my face. Something unnatural stared back at me. It had a lupine snout, with skin stretched over its elongated maw, and a pair of 16-point antlers sticking out of its head. It looked terrifying, but one factor made it much more horrifying than the monster itself. That monster was me. It was then that I prayed harder than I had ever prayed. I asked God why. Why do I suffer while sinners are relieved? Why is this the path I am told to take? Why does humanity see me as the monster instead of the monster wearing a white lab coat? I was lamenting in my thoughts when the lights went out. A couple of subjects from a neighboring plant, three teenage boys named Erebus, A, and Sledog, had escaped and cut power to their facility and the surrounding facilities. With this, all doors were unlocked. As soon as I realized this, I burst through the now open door. I ran blindly, due to night blindness, trying to escape. I somehow reached the front doors and fled, not knowing where I was going until bright lights shone ahead of me. The van stopped as soon as I scrambled out onto the road. That moment was one of the most terrifying moments in my life. I thought they'd turn tail and start running, sliding so wildly that they slam into a tree. Instead, a young boy with wavy, dirty blonde hair and an almost square face walked out of the back. Despite the urgency that could be noticed on his face, he seemed confident. Which was surprising. Acknowledging my freakish face and the fact that he was barely scraping six feet tall. Come on, he says in a deep voice. I can only stand in shock that he'd talk to me. We can help you, just get in the back, he yelled back at me. That was all it took for me to clamber into the back of the truck. First off, can you talk? The boy asked inquisitively. I answered a curt, yes, in reply. Next, do you have a name? In which I again tersely responded, Walter. The feelings that were suppressed for however long came flooding out. 
I tried to stop it but I could still feel tears leaking out of my fiendish eyes. The boy asked me if I was alright, in which I laid every bit of information I knew upon him. My rejection from the army, my flight out here, the laborious months, Prodigy 3, the cut, everything. He looked at me sympathetically, taking notes and absorbing information. Proverbs, 12. 10 inches are the only words that the boy said after everything. What? I answered, bewildered. Proverbs 12. 10. Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. In God's eyes, you're no more an outcast than the football quarterback or a common housefly, and there will always be those that see it. You may never return to normal, but you are as much of a person as anyone else in our care. You just need to learn to see that, the boy stated. I looked at that kid, and I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The truck slowed to a stop, and I could only assume that we reached our destination. The boy went to exit the back but I hurriedly called out, Wait. What is your name? He turned back to me and replied, My name is Nick, but everyone here calls me Nightwalker. With that, he jumped out of the van and made his way towards some unseen destination. I stepped out and gazed up at the night sky for the first time in what seemed like eons. I stared up at the heavens and asked for forgiveness for my rage earlier. I then turned around and walked towards the large white fortress. I am the son of an army ranger. I am the army's greatest mistake. But I am not a monster, as there are no monsters in God's eyes. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.